log cabin this morning. I'm going to pause. We are recording on Teddy Pins, and I'm glad you're here. Uh, you will need to be on camera and facing the camera in order to get credit for CE. That's how uh, the state audits and tracks that. There's also a study guide that is in the chat that you need to download, and Jim will explain more about that of what you'll need to do there to get credit. Uh, I personally have been through this course. It is fantastic. Jim covers a lot of amazing details, and I'm going to let him share a little bit about his background, but um, I will tell you that I kind of followed some of Jim's stuff as he was sharing it. And um, I don't normally explore new, uh, always new vendors or new inspectors, but there was a lot of things that he was doing consistently that I was really impressed by. And I can tell his attention to detail, professionalism is wonderful. So um, again, if you have questions, you can put it in the chat um, or go ahead and um, you, know, you can raise your hand through Zoom. I'll be uh, checking this, I'll be kind of visualizing here or, auditing this for everyone and, and um, proctoring it, I guess. But again, you do need to be on camera. And if your name is not um, on there, if it just says iPhone, if you could change your name so I know who it is there. Um, I think that's it. Uh, and I will turn it over to Jim Rudiger with Galaxy Property Inspections. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And thank you to everybody for spending a couple hours. My name is Jim. I will be your entertainer today. Um, I'll tell you more about my company later. Um, just today, we're going to talk about basic training uh, when it comes to uh, your home appliances. And I'm going to try to give you stuff that you can use um, to uh, give better customer service to your customers. And when they push back on certain issues, you'll have a little bit of, of knowledge to, uh, to give them. Uh, just a quick note about me. I spent 18 years in the home appliance industry before I opened my inspection company. Um, 11 of those years, I was the national training manager for Electrolux and Frigidaire. Um, uh, rules of the class, you can ask me any question about major appliances as long as we're on that topic, right? So if it's a refrigeration question, let's, let's talk about that. We're talking about refrigerators rather than you know, when we get to gas ranges, because, you know, you keep everything in sync. Um, there is a lot to cover. I talk really fast. I get very passionate about, um, you know, when I teach. Um, I don't know. I never know what I'm going to say, what jokes are going to come out of my mouth, what songs I might start singing. You just kind of got to deal with it. Um, the study guide, as we go, all answers, I will cover all answers to the study guide, but in order to get credit, at the very end, you're going to have to take a picture of your study guide and text it to me. So you might want to write down my phone number. Well, of course, it's a great phone number to have in your, in your uh, phone when you need a home inspector, obviously. But um, at the end, and I'll expect this, you know, within the next five minutes, right after class ends, all you got to do, and I'll, we'll cover this again at the very end, you just snap a picture. Make sure that your first name and your last name written on the study guide is as it is in Trek. Okay, because when I send in the class roster, if your name doesn't match what's in the Trek database, um, sometimes that can um, sometimes that can glitch. So make sure it's first name, last name, as it is in the Trek database, and your realtor number, nice and clear, so that I can see it. And again, we'll talk about that uh, when we're done. So this class is going to be like a class you've never had before. You know, I'm not the typical home inspector. Um, this class is going to cover refrigerators. I'm not trying to turn any of you into technicians, but I will be covering some technical information, especially with refrigerators. You know, when I get too much into, you know, how the sealed system works, some of you are going to be going, good Lord, what is this crap? Okay, just stay with me. I'll make sure that we bring it full circle. And at the end, you know, light bulbs will go on and go, okay, and a lot of this stuff makes sense. Okay, the refrigeration is probably the hardest part to get through. The dishwasher, washer, dryer is kind of fun. And then we'll end with gas and electric ranges. Um, we're starting a little bit late. So um, this usually takes me right on the dot two hours. Um, I'll try to hurry a little bit, but I don't want to miss anything. So, okay. And I don't know what level of information you already know and where you are already expert. So I will just treat you all as if you know nothing. And then if you learn a little bit, that's great. If you learn a lot, that's even better. Okay. Um, I guarantee you're going to learn something. So, all right, let's talk refrigerators. There's three types of refrigerators that are on your screen. Okay. The first one. All right. Some people call that a French door. It's not really a French door in the industry. It's actually called a multi-door refrigerator. Um, the reason people call it a French door is because it actually resembles a French armoire. 
All right, when you open up a French armoire, you open up the top, that's where shelves are and stuff for, you know, clothes. And then there's a big drawer at the bottom for bedding and heavy sweaters and things like that. If you ask a French person, they tell you it's a refrigerator. So um, that's where the word French door comes from. It looks like a French armoire. Um, and then the middle one's obviously a side-by-side -side and, and the one over on the, on the um, uh, to your right is a top mount. Now in refrigeration, we don't care about the fresh food section. All the magic happens in the freezer. Okay, cold air is never, is never made in the refrigerator. It's always made in the freezer. It's a byproduct of the refrigeration process. And we're gonna talk about that in depth, okay? And when the fresh food section needs cold air, it literally just steals some from the freezer, okay? And it's, it's kind of important for you to understand how a refrigerator works because now we live in a zone, you know, we live in a temperature zone where we're going into winter. When we go into winter, refrigerators, uh, they tend to work differently in the winter than they do in the summer, right? And I'm going to cover all that. Again, not trying to turn you into technicians, but a little knowledge goes a long way, okay? Now, refrigerator set temperature. As a home inspector, I'm guilty of resetting people's refrigerators all the time because they've set their temperatures too cold, okay? The fresh food section, all right, the whole thing is a refrigerator, okay? The refrigerator is divided into two sections, the fresh food and the freezer. The fresh food should always be at 37 or 38. It should never be any warmer. It should never be any colder. And the reason for that is, <clears throat> and I see this a lot, I see where people say, well, I like my milk real cold, so I'm going to set it down at 34, 30, you know, 35, et cetera. Um, uh, this is bad, and let me tell you why. Refrigerator temperatures are only accurate plus or minus two degrees and every refrigerator is different. So if it's set at 37, it could read as high as 39, it could read as low as 35, right? If you set it higher, for example, say we set the fresh food temperature at 40 degrees. Remember, plus or minus two degrees, what does that mean? It could be 42 degrees actually in the actual temperature in the refrigerator. You know what starts growing at 42 degrees? Salmonella, yep. Mold and fungus and salmonella starts to grow at 42 degrees. So if you have it set at 40, you might be getting sick, right? Conversely, say, you know, we set it down to make 30, you know, 36, 35, 34, again, plus or minus two degrees. You know, if you're setting it down 35, 34, next thing you know, everything in the refresh food section is going to start to freeze because it could actually, actual temperature could be 32 degrees. Right, and so 37 to 38 degrees is optimal temperature to keep your produce fresh and keep everything at a nice set temperature in the fresh food where it's not cold enough that it's gonna start decreasing the life of vegetables and fruits and start freezing things. And it's not gonna start growing, you know, nasty fungus and, and stuff that will make you sick. Um, so that's why that's important. Um, in, the, uh, in the freezer, it's got to be set at zero. Now you think, well, things start freezing at 32 degrees, so why does it have to be zero? Hmm. The answer is ice cream. Ice cream will, because of the salt content in ice cream, ice cream will start going soft at five degrees. Five degrees, right? So if you want soft ice cream, turn the temperature up a little bit in your freezer, okay? Otherwise, it should be set at zero. Now again, plus or minus two degrees. So even if you're set at zero, you could actually be setting your freezer at negative two. Um, but these are really the optimal temperatures that we want these units to be. Okay, now 55 or 34. The temperature that there's a, there's a temperature where a refrigerator will work and there are temperatures where a refrigerator will not work. Okay, um, all refrigerators, every refrigerator that's out there, every refrigerator that's in your home, that's being sold at Lowe's, Home Depot, uh, I don't know, Menards, um, some of the regional places like PC Richards, etc. They're all made to work at 55 degrees. Okay, they're all made to work at 55 degrees. It would be better if I use my arrows here. Okay, all refrigerators are designed to work above 55 degrees. Okay, and the top end temperature is generally around 110. Now, if we were in Phoenix, I'd probably be talking about the high end temperatures, but we're in Nashville, so I'm going to talk about the low end temperatures. All right, because generally speaking, you know, refrigerators in Nashville aren't in environments that are 110 degrees. But what does this mean? Your refrigerator is designed to work inside a single family home, okay? And at 55 degrees, generally, you know, if we think of all our, you know, your kitchen, your kitchen's probably 68, 70, 72 degrees, somewhere in that little range. And so your refrigerator works great. Below 55 degrees, 
it's not designed to work. Now, with the multi-door and the, uh, well, maybe that's not gonna work. There we go. There we go. With the multi-door and the fresh food, they technically will work down to 34 degrees because they use something called a negative coefficient thermistor. And I'm not gonna explain how it works, but um, at 34 degrees, they will not work anymore. Okay, now between 55 and 34, they will work, but you're really overworking the compressor and the evaporator and the condenser motor and the evaporator motor and the, damp the damper assemblies and things like that. They're really not designed to work in those cold temperatures. Top mounts, flat out will not work below 55 unless you alter them, okay? Why is this important? Because you are realtors and you like to sell nice big houses to people that might want a refrigerator in their garage, right? And if somebody asks you, hey, can I, you know, what do you think? And, you know, I can put a refrigerator in a garage. Yes, you can, but it depends on what kind and realize that depending on the temperature, the refrigerator may or may not work. Below 34 degrees, nothing works, okay? It's not designed to work that way. With the top mount below 55 degrees, you can actually add something called a garage kit. All right, a garage kit, um, if the temperature gets colder, 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 um, when the compressor kicks on, the garage kit's basically a heater. It's a heater that wraps around the mechanical thermostat that fools it into believing that it's warmer than 55 degrees, okay? So the big takeaway from all of this is refrigerators belong in a house. And if your clients ask you about you know, a garage refrigerator, yeah, they can have one in there. If it's a top mount, recommend that they get a garage kit if it's side by side or French door, that's fine. Just realize that during the super cold temperatures, January, February, March, we don't get a lot of snow in this part of the uh, world, but the temperatures do get down to you know 10 degrees, 20 degrees. Your refrigerator is not going to work properly. You're the, the, the refrigerator basically thinks mm, it's cold outside, must be cold enough inside. Okay, so those are important numbers to know. There's a little picture of me at my last house. Um, yeah, that's me actually, you know, you know, we don't get that kind of snow around here, but, um, they do in a lot of places. And so, um, somebody that's moving here from a different climate, they might not realize, you know, that anywhere that you live, temp refrigeration works different in Chicago than it does in Nashville, than it does in New Orleans. Okay. Simply because of temperatures, seasonal temperatures. All right. Again, if I'm going too fast, just stop me. All right, so the parts of the sealed system. This is where we're gonna get a little technical and you just kinda of gotta punch through this part and stay with me because when we're all done, you're actually gonna understand how refrigerators work, dehumidifiers, split air units, HVAC units, they all use um, refrigeration. And refrigeration is the same regardless of what kind of configuration you put it in, okay? Now, the heart of the sealed system obviously is a compressor. Everybody, you know, Everybody's heard of a compressor, but what does it do? The compressor is basically a pump. It's a motor, all right? And it pulls refrigerant from the low side, all right? We're in, just stay with me and you'll understand all this. We pull refrigerant from the low side and we push it out to the high side. We're compressing, um, we're, comp we're pulling a gas, okay? We're compressing that gas and pushing that out, out to the high pressure side of the system in the form of a liquid. Now, keep in mind, the, the, a sealed system is meant to keep things cold, right? We're talking about a refrigerator in your house, 37 and zero degrees, right? The temperature of the refrigerant, when it leaves the compressor, is about 180 degrees. It is really hot, okay? And while we're on the subject of refrigerants, just so you know, um, no, number one, nobody uses the word Freon anymore. Take that out of your vocabulary. That's... Um, that was a slang term for R12, which has been illegal for 30 years. Uh, they left R12, went to R22, that's illegal now. Then they went to R134A. Guess what? As of January 1st, R134A is illegal. It has been taken out of production. There are no units being sold at Lowe's, Home Depot, or any other store right now that have R134A in them. That refrigerant is gone. The new refrigerant that replaced it is R600A. It's called isobutane. It sounds, if butane sounds familiar, it's the same stuff you'd find in a butane lighter. That's what they're now using worldwide as the primary refrigerant for 
uh, refrigerators that you find in your house. Why? Because uh, R600A is, uh, it's not a hydrochlorofluorocarbon. It's, a, it's just a fluorocarbon, meaning what's the, what's, the, what's the moral of the story? You can vent it out the window. You don't have to reclaim the refrigerant. Okay, getting back, so that's a side note. Getting back to the compressor. So refrigerant leaves the compressor, whether it's in an HVAC unit or in a refrigerator or in a split air unit, it's all the same. It leaves the compressor, it's about 180 degrees. And it goes to the condenser. Now, for those of us that have been around a long time, do you remember the refrigerators that had that black uh, grill on the back of it? All right, everybody just nod your head. Yeah, we do. That was the condenser, okay? That was called a static condenser. And for you know the fit, feel, and finish of the product, they decided to take that, that static condenser and roll it up into a ball. And now it's underneath the refrigerator on the left-hand side. It's always on the left-hand side. Okay, again, refrigerators, it doesn't matter whose name tag is on them. It doesn't matter how big they are or how many doors they have. They all work the same way. The condenser is now folded up. It's called a dynamic condenser, and it's on the left side. All right, so refrigerant passes through the condenser, and as it passes through the condenser, it starts to bleed off temperature, which is one of the most important things about owning a refrigerator. You got to clean underneath it from time to time. Why? Because we clean dust off of the condenser so that refrigerant can cool. Because if the refrigerant can't cool, then your refrigerator stops working correctly. Okay, um, and the very last part of the condenser, actually, just so you know, it actually runs uh, around the cabinet um, right at the surface. If you open up the doors while the compressors, you can hear whether or not your refrigerator is running. Um, if you open up the doors and actually put your hands on the cabinet, right where the doors would seal. It'll feel either room temperature, it might feel a little warm. That's because of the hot refrigerant flowing through something called the hot tube, okay? It leaves the condenser and it goes through a capillary tube. Remember, this is the high side. We've still, we're still compressed this refrigerant into a hot gas. So again, just stay with me. This will make sense here in a minute, okay? So we've compressed that refrigerant and it's a hot gas flowing through the condenser. And then it enters something called the capillary tube. The capillary tube is about the size of one of those um, you ever order coffee and they bring you that tiny little straw that's meant as a stir? That's about the size of a cap tube, okay? It enters that and it's still a liquid, okay? And then as it passes through, it passes through the filter dryer. Filter dryer um, is filled with desiccant. If you ever have, if you've ever, I think girls, you, 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 you order makeup or guys, you order tennis shoes or you buy electronics, there's that little pack of silica gel it's in there, that's a desiccant, right? It's supposed to absorb moisture. That's basically what's in a filter dryer. It absorbs any moisture that's in the system. And as the refrigerant leaves the, the capillary tube and filter dryer, and there's the evaporator. That's where all the magic happens. The evaporator's in the freezer, okay? <clears throat> now, when it leaves the capillary tube and enters the evaporator, it boils, okay? Now, we all think of water boiling. Water boiling, if it's 100% pure water, water will boil at 212 degrees. Fahrenheit. Y'all with me? Now, if you pour water from your sink right now and stick it on your stove, it'll probably boil at about 195, 200 degrees because of the amount of salts and minerals that are in the water and the pressure, because we're not at sea level here. Pressure will boil water, same as temperature, okay? Boiling, boiling is nothing more than changing a liquid to a gas. Refrigerant boils at negative 20. So when that, that hot, that gas, that's by the time it gets through the capillary tube, it's, it's cooled down to the about 80 degrees, right? When it leaves the capillary tube and enters the evaporator, it boils instantly. The pressure drops to negative and the temperature drops to negative 20. So the refrigerant traveling through the evaporator is negative 20. That is very cold. And then any air passing over the evaporator is going to get very cold. That is refrigeration. Refrigeration is not making cold air. Refrigeration is removing heat and humidity from the air, okay? And then from the evaporator, that's the low side. Remember the pressure dropped, okay, um, instantly. And then it goes back to the compressor. And so it goes constantly through that cycle, the entire life of um, of the refrigerator, okay? Now, that was a long way to go. 
And here, uh, this little diagram, you might look at the one on the left. Okay, we leave the compressor. It's red hot. It's traveling through the condenser. It's kind of cooling off a little bit. And it travels up through the evaporator, you know, and as the, as the refrigerant travels through the evaporator, when it, when it enters the evaporator, it's really cold. Remember, negative 20. But then as it kind of travels through the evaporator, as warm air is going over the evaporator, the refrigerant warms up just a little bit. And then it comes back to the compressor and the cycle starts all over again. Now, why on earth would you need to know that? All right, this is why, okay? You sell houses to clients that sometimes, um, if you think about it, when you sell a house, what questions are asked? You know, what's the taxes in this area? You know, what, you know, what kind of school district is this in? Um, are the appliances staying, right? Most of your clients are moving into a house with appliances they've never dealt with before. Appliances that were either there, appliances that are new that the builder put in, or maybe they brought their own appliances. Who knows, right? Most of the time the appliances are staying, would you agree? So now they got to get used to new controls and new appliances, appliances that they're not used to. Now, when the refrigerant, let's go back to the sealed system. When the refrigerant leaves the capillary tube and enters the evaporator tube, it changes the pressure, the pressure drops, turns to negative 20, and we're now cooling the air. When it leaves, when it boils, it can make a little knocking noise. That's the pressure dropping from leaving the capillary tube to the evaporator tube. People will ask you, and I used to get asked this all the time, why does my refrigerator sometimes make a knocking noise? Why does your client just moved into a new house they're not used to? They got up in the middle of the night. You call them up, hey, how is everything? Fine, but the refrigerator makes funny knocking noises from time to time. Perfectly normal. It's the refrigerant leaving the capillary tube and going to the evaporator tube. That's the refrigerant boiling and doing its job. At sooner or later, every one of you, your refrigerator, it'll make a little knocking noise from time to time. It's totally normal. Okay, but now you can explain why refrigerators make a knocking noise, but you also understand the process of refrigeration, right? Leaves the cap, leaves the compressor, sends to the condenser. If you think about an HVAC unit, you got a compressor, it goes to the condenser, right? It travels through a capillary tube, which is the tiny little refrigerant tube. It goes to an evaporator, right? And makes cold air and blows the cold air through the house, right? So in a house, the HVAC is the refrigeration unit and you are the food if your whole house is the refrigerator, <laughs> right? right? So, um, okay, any questions on the sealed system? If you, if you have any questions, just stick them in the chat and, um, and we'll go from there. Okay, what's the best kind of refrigerator to buy? This is my advice. Now, again, I was in the business for 18 years, okay? I've taught over 500 classes on appliances, anywhere from customer service to just the basics to bringing technicians into a hotel with re appliances and tearing them down all the way and diagnosing the boards and the transistors and everything. I've taught it all, okay? When somebody asks you about what's the best refrigerator to buy, how much do they want to spend? What features do you want? A lot of people want this. Um, have you seen the new Samsungs? Again, you all can just nod. Have you seen the Samsungs with that giant video display thing on the door that seems really cool, plays music and you know, your refrigerator will talk to you and play movies. You want to stare at your refrigerator all the time. Um, just so you know, that's really cool. But that part, uh, cost on that part is $800. Now, generally, when a technician comes to your house and you need parts, they double the price of the part. That's industry standard. They're not screwing you over. That's the standard. The $5 part, they'll charge you 10. If it's an $800 part, they'll charge you 1600 and then labor to put it in. So if you buy that that Samsung with that great big you know iPad in it, and it goes out after a couple of years, and it's no longer in warranty, um, and you don't have a homeowner's war like a home warranty, yeah, it could be a two thousand dollars service call. I probably get you two refrigerators for that. All right. So what features do you want? The ease of service and the ease of getting service parts. I always recommend Frigidaire Whirlpool GE. Why? Because every tech out there knows how to work on them and the service parts are plentiful if something breaks. In fact, most technicians will have those parts on their truck. 
Whereas if it's LG or Samsung, um, technicians don't stock those parts and you generally have to wait anywhere from a week to three weeks for the part. Why? Because Samsung and LG do not like to make service parts available. They like to keep all of their parts uh, on the production line, okay? So if the refrigerator needs a new compressor, there's a good chance the guy's either got on his truck or he can just run down to the parts supply store here in Nashville and get it and be back the same day or the, or the next day. If it's an LG compressor, might be waiting two or three weeks. Okay, so it, there's a lot of pros and cons and what you want. Now, demo mode. Um, interesting, I just had a discussion in the field about demo mode the other day with a realtor. Um, she was from Jersey. She knew all about this slide that I'm going to cover. Demo mode is when we have an appliance that we want to sell in a showroom. And so like if it's a refrigerator, and if you think about it, if it's on the showroom floor of say Lowe's, right? We want the lights to work. We want the bells and the whistles to work. We don't need the compressor to work. We don't need the thing running, you know, cold, right? So we just want the bells and whistles to work, but we don't want the inner workings to work. We don't need the condenser fan, the evaporator fan, the damper motor, you know, things like that. We don't need that stuff working but we want all the lights and the pretty features working so that people will buy the product, right? And almost every appliance out there has it. If you have an appliance that's less than five years old, chances are your appliance has demo mode, all right? Actually, if you have an appliance that's less than 10 years old, okay? Now, why would you need to know that? Because you should know what Sabbath mode is. You are all realtors and sooner or later, you're gonna sell a house to somebody who's Jewish, okay? Now, I'm from the Northeast and, you know, I used to oversee New Jersey, all of New Jersey's Jewish, right? Do you have a lot of Jewish people here in Nashville? Yeah, currently there's over 15,000 people here in the, in the Nashville metro area who are Jewish and that population grows every week, right? Grows every year. Um, and why would you need to know what Sabbath mode is, okay? In the Jewish faith, there are rules that they have to follow on the Sabbath, okay? Um, anybody here, if I show, I mean, I'm just seeing all your cameras. Anybody here Jewish? No. One, Joseph, okay. So just nod if, if just everyone not watch Joseph, he's just gonna nod through this, okay? So Sabbath ends, or it starts about like an hour before sundown on Friday and ends about an hour after sunset on Saturday. And according to the Jewish faith, there are rules that they have to follow. Everybody thinks, oh, you can't work on Saturdays. No, that is not it at all, okay? There are different rules that they have to follow for their religion. One of the rules is they cannot make fire, right? Turning on a light bulb, that is turning on an electric spark, that is fire, that is a violation of their faith, all right? That's against the rules, right? So the manufacturers came up with Sabbath mode. Sabbath mode's been around for oh, 15, maybe 20 years now. Sabbath mode is the opposite of demo mode. Remember, demo mode, we wanted all the, the fit, feel, and finish, the lights and, and all the pretty features to work, but not the inner workings. The opposite is Sabbath mode, all right? So when we put an appliance in Sabbath mode, you open up the doors, the lights aren't gonna work. The touch pad on that Samsung, not gonna work. However, the compressor will still work. It'll still keep the food cold. All right, the damper still work, the condenser fan, all that is being controlled by the main board of the refrigerator, not the person, all right? If an appliance is star K, okay, and you can see this, if you don't believe me, go and look at any of your appliances when we're done, look at the model serial number with a flashlight, you might see a tiny little star with a K in it. If it's star K, it has Sabbath mode, and it has been blessed on the production line by a rabbi, right, as having is being Sabbath mode. Now, the other thing about Jewish folks, they need two refrigerators. When you sell them a house, they're gonna have to have two refrigerators. Why? Because they can't mix their dairy products and their meat products, right? Now, some non-practicing Jewish folks, they don't care. But if they're practicing Jewish, right, they need two refrigerators. And so you might get, sooner or later, you might come across that situation, right? They need a kitchen that has two refrigerators. Why? They've got to separate their dairy from their meats, okay? Sabbath mode also can be found on a dishwasher, can be found on ranges. It can be found on most refrigerators nowadays. Anything that's got electronic controls, almost all of it now has Sabbath mode. 
Why do I bring this up? Because kids love to touch things. And kids, they love to touch and play with electronics. And if they touch the wrong two buttons and hold them at the same time, they could kick the appliance into Sabbath mode. And the appliance will work, but none of the lights work, right? So if you run into something where like, yeah, this appliance, I like this refrigerator, but none of the lights work. So I'm probably gonna need a service call. It's like, hmm, time out. I wonder if it's in Sabbath mode. How do you get a moment? How do you get a refrigerator or any appliance out of Sabbath mode? unplug it and plug it back in. But here's the catch. You have to unplug it for two minutes. Okay. Anytime, remember, uh, we used to have to like unplug our computers and take the battery out. Remember that old school to like do a reboot and you wait a minute and you put your battery back in and blah, blah, blah. Uh, that was called hard booting your, um, your computer. Sometimes you have to like reset your phone. You have to, you know, turn it off, turn it back on, reset your computer, et cetera. You have to do that to your appliances every now and then. But when you unplug an appliance, it has to be off for a minimum of two minutes and then plug it back in. That will do something called a power on reset to the main board and it will reset it to its, to its uh, factory settings. Okay, so two minutes, you can either unplug it or you can just flip the breaker um, from either the main panel or sub panel, whatever the house has. Okay, so that's demo mode and Sabbath mode. All right, manual defrost and auto defrost. Most chest freezers that you'll find out in a, in a uh, garage, a lot of them are manual defrost. That just means uh, they're not gonna defrost on their own. And so once every six months, once every year, you need to unplug it, otherwise it's gonna frost up and look like that. And when it does, uh, believe it or not, it's actually not cooling very well. You think, hey, that's a giant ice ball. That keeps things very cool. Mm -hmm. Actually, it doesn't, all right? And if you don't believe me, just ask an Eskimo. There's a reason why they make their houses, the white igloos are made out of ice, right? Because of the thermal properties of water and ice, yeah, it actually keeps them kind of warm. So that's why we have to defrost things. Um, auto defrost, um, auto defrost, um, I would say that every single one of you has a refrigerator in your house right now. It goes through auto defrost three times a day for about 20 minutes, okay? Meaning, it, stop, it turns off and um, a great big giant heater that is looped around that evaporator comes on and defrosts. It, it actually heats up the evaporator, um, not really red hot, but it heats it up pretty good. And all that water and all that ice defrosts off of the evaporator and goes into a drain and goes down to a pan that is underneath, um, that's underneath the refrigerator, right? The question is, why don't refrigerators need to be hooked up to a drain when they're defrosting three times a day and all that water is dripping off of that evaporator and going into a pan underneath the refrigerator? Why? You already understand why. You just didn't realize it. Remember, that compressor, when, when refrigerant leaves the compressor, it's 180 degrees, meaning that compressor is really hot. In fact, let me back up a couple slides, this slide. Right here. The compressor is really hot. That condenser is really hot. Um, there's a fan that's helping to blow air over the condenser. It pulls air in on the left side of every refrigerator that in all of your houses, air is being pulled in constantly on the left side of your refrigerator. It blows across the condenser to kind of help cool the refrigerant. It blows across the compressor to help cool the refrigerant. And then it blows out on the right side. It's nice and hot. You know what's on the right side? The pan that is full of water from the defrost cycle from the evaporator. And so all that hot air blowing across the pan evaporates the water. That's why refrigerators don't have to be hooked up to a drain. It's also why if you get up, if any of you, or if any of you are close to your kitchen and you happen to get up for a second and go look at, your, at the grill on the bottom of your refrigerator, you're gonna find that the left side is dirty and the right side is clean. Someone's gonna do it. I guarantee you someone's gonna go do it. The left side's gonna be dirty and the right side's gonna be clean. Why? Because all the hair and dirt from you know your rabbits and your dogs and your giraffes and, and elephants, whatever you got running around your house, that all gets sucked in on the left and sticks to the grill on the left side. The air circulates underneath and blows out on the right side right side's nice and clean. Well, we're all done. Go look at your refrigerator. I guarantee you one side's dirtier than the other. 
right? And then, yeah, if, you, if auto defrost, if a technician finds that, yeah, there's a problem. Or that. I actually took that picture back in 2009. That was somebody who really forgot to put their freezer into a manual defrost, and they had to unplug it for two weeks before all that ice melted. Two weeks. That's a long time. I think it started out like a about a 13 cubic foot freezer. We're down to about a yeah, foot and a half. Good stuff. Okay, let's talk about water filters real quick. Water filters, your, your uh, customers might ask you questions about water filters. Here's the thing. How often do you think you need to change a water filter? Everybody hold up a number. Uh, how many months? How many months do we need to change a water filter? Yep. And if you were holding up the number six, you were correct. Every six months, you got to change your water filter. Okay. Now, how often you have to change your water filter? Filter, believe it or not, is built into an algorithm inside your refrigerator, and it's based on how many times you open and close the doors, how many times you actuate the ice maker, right? So, how many times did you get ice out of the door? If you're constantly getting ice out of the door, you're gonna have to change your your water filter um, more often because it just, it, all right, I open the door this many times and we use the ice maker this many times. So that means we must have used this much water. And so it must be time to um, replace the water filter. That's how your refrigerator knows. It's based, on, it's based on an algorithm that's built inside the main board. Here's the thing. If you have a Samsung, you need to use a Samsung filter. If you use a GE, you need to use a GE filter. The worst advice that you could give to your, to your clients is just go on Amazon and order a generic filter. The worst advice ever. Why? Because the company that's making that generic knockoff, they actually took the refrigerator, the, the, they actually got a, you know, a, a water filter, say from Samsung, and then did their best to reverse engineer it. But they didn't have all the right specs. It's pretty close. It's pretty close, but not quite. So if you use that knockoff filter, it'll work. And then if you pull it out, put another knockoff filter in, it'll leak. You have a 99% chance it'll leak. If you're using knockoff filters sooner or later, your water filter will leak. 99% chance. That's from the OEMs. All right, cleaning the refrigerator. Okay. The one thing you never use when you clean a refrigerator, a lot of people now have stainless steel. The one thing you never, ever, ever, ever use on stainless steel is Windex. Okay. You have to use an approved cleaner. It says stainless steel right on there. It's got to use an approved cleaner. You spray it on, you wipe it off, you let it dry, you wipe it off again. Oh. You spray it on, you wipe it off, you let it dry, then you wipe it off again. That's how you clean a refrigerator. You never ever use uh, Windex, and I'll tell you why. Windex has ammonium in it. Ammonium will break down stainless steel. It'll rust it. It'll take the shine off of it. It'll turn it yellow. It'll actually pit the steel. Nobody yeah. wants any pitted steel. Hey, Jim, real quick, we have two questions in the uh, couple yes. of in the chat here. Uh, Joseph says uh, some refrigerators say recommended setting minimum or maximum is recommended temp around thirty-seven degrees from the company that built it. Yes. Yes. Great. Yes, and if it's got a dial, it's right smack in the middle. For like a refrigerator that might be like one to seven, three and a half. That's 37 degrees. Awesome. Secondly, uh, how do you clean the condenser coils? Uh, it's easy. You pop the little grill off at the bottom and you buy a condenser uh, coil brush oh boy. from Lowe's or Walmart, Home Depot. They're like three bucks. And you can actually get in there and, and clean it or you can just use your vacuum cleaner. It's literally, it you, they use that hose attached with that little thing attachment that they put on. Yeah, Love it. We'll get, suck it right Other on. questions, uh, Virginia, water filter. Does this mean I, I must order from the manufacturer even if Amazon says it's approved for my make and model? Um, yes, or you can buy it from Home Depot or whatever because Home Depot, you know, Home Depot sells Samsung. They also sell Samsung filters. You know, they sell Frigidaire, they sell Frigidaire filters. They sell GE, they also sell GE filters, right? Or you can get it from the manufacturer. I'm just or saying you could, if, 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 you, if you use say knockoff brand X, if you, can't, if you only use knockoff brand X, you'll be okay. If you go from knockoff brand X back to an original filter, it'll leak. 
If you Ooh. go from not from knockoff brand X to knockoff brand Y, it'll leak. Almost guaranteed. That's what they say about realtors too. All right, next. Um, if someone <laughs> used a bad cleaner on stainless steel, is there any way to undo the damage? Uh, yes. And I'm hesitant to tell you what it is. Okay, so if you've used a bad cleaner on, on stainless steel and it starts to get a little bit of surface rust, WD-40 will take the surface rust off. However, you then have to get the WD-40 off. So I've had customers that have a little surface rust on their stainless steel. Little WD-40, spray it on, wipe it off. Take soap and water, clean it. Then take an approved stainless steel cleaner, spray it on, wipe it off, let it dry, wipe it off again. And I'd probably do that two or three times. You have to make sure you get the WD-40 off. WD-40 will take off surface rust, but if you leave the WD-40 on there, it will rust it 10 times worse. So you can get it off with, the with I mean, WD-40 is basically, it's a solvent, okay? Um, it's good for a lot of things. It's actually really good for toilets, but we won't get into that conversation. Um, you can get the surface rust off with WD-40, but then you have to use soap and water to get the WD-40 off, and then you have to use an approved cleaner. Do you yep. have to leave that? How long should you leave that WD-40 on? Uh, about two seconds. There you go. Yeah, uh, spray it on, wipe it off. It should take, cool. it takes, it'll, it'll take it right off. You just have to be very careful because you, you know, if you don't get it all off, you could actually cause your um, you can actually cause more damage to the stainless steel. Other okay. good questions that are in the chat. Why do I have ice forming in the back of my refrigerator? <laughs> um, number one, it's too cold. Or number two, uh, oh boy, this is a side conversation. Um, it's either too cold, it's set too cold. Um, so it should be, I'd set it up to 38 if it's at 37 or make sure it's not down at 36 or 35. Um, you might have an air leak in the damper. Um, or the damper is not closing all the way, or you might have air, you definitely have air migrating up from the freezer section into the fresh food section by way of the back air handler. So we call it that rabbit hole, hole like, so right? We call can talk about that offline. All right. Yep. Um, my Whirlpool I freezer ice maker doesn't work. Should I just buy a new fridge? <laughs> How much will it cost me? Um, it depends. Um, it depends on what, what kind it is. Is it in the fresh food section or is it in the freezer section? If it's in the freezer section, those are plug and play. You literally, <clears throat> they're about a hundred bucks. You literally um, unscrew two screws, pop it out, uh, pop out the wire harness, plug a new one in. It should be good. If it's in the fresh food section, that's a whole other story. Typical service call, uh, probably run you $180 with parts or that's, that's um, labor and parts. Um, whirlpools are pretty easy to fix. So I would go with calling a technician and fixing it. Um, if it was a Samsung, I'd tell you to buy another refrigerator because Samsung has a class action lawsuit going right now on their fresh food ice makers. There you go. All right, Jim, go ahead. I think that covers us here. All right, so questions that we covered about um, the clients, all right? Is my refrigerator energy efficient? Depends on where it is. If it's in the garage, no. If it's in your house, yes. It doesn't matter what kind it is, and it really doesn't matter what brand it is, okay? If it's working in your house, it's energy efficient because that's the way all refrigerators are designed. And how much energy will they use in a year? I don't know, about 18 bucks. What temperature should my refrigerator set to? 37, possibly 38, depends. Uh, refrigerator work in a garage during winter. Um, yeah, unless it's the temperature's down below 34 degrees. And if it's a top mount, it has to have a garage kit installed. And again, a garage kit is just a little heater that wraps around the thermostat to fool the thermostat into thinking it's actually warmer outside than it really is. What kind of cleaner should I use? You always use an approved cleaner. You never use Windex. How often do I change the water filter every six months? Sabbath mode, you know what that is now and why it's important. And trust me, again, growing population of, of Jewish folks here in, in Nashville, you know, 15,000 um, Nashvillians are Jewish. And why is my refrigerator making a knocking noise? I gave you a very long explanation, but it's refrigerant expanding from the cap tube into the evaporator. Okay. 
All right, moving on to dishwashers. And I hate to say it, I know more about dishwashers than I do refrigerators. Um, so, and I love dishwashers. Now there are people say, oh, there's dish, my dishwasher doesn't work. Every dishwasher works, all right? The question is, are you using it properly? And some of the stuff that I'm gonna go over with dishwashers, really gonna blow your mind, okay? I will literally blow your mind when I tell you how dishwashers really work because it's not at all what you think. Okay, so a dishwasher is nothing more than a box that throws water around. It doesn't have any scrubbing people. It doesn't have any scrubbers in there. Um, it's just a box that throws water around. So if you want clean dishes, there's a few things that we have to tell our clients. The best thing that you can tell your clients about dishwashers, now think about it. Some, some of your clients are moving from maybe an apartment into a house. Every one of you at some point probably had, this is their first house, right? Raise your hands. If you've had a client, this is their first house, right? Some of them probably never use a dishwasher before. Here's the thing with dishwashers. You have to run the water at the kitchen sink until it's hot. If you do not do this, your dishwasher is not going to work properly. And chances are, if I asked you to raise your hand, how many of you run the the, the water at the sink and to make sure it's hot before you start the dishwasher. Chances are one, Lucy, do you do it? No, she said no. All right, yeah, I guarantee you're not doing this. Well, if you're not- I did since I took your course, I did. You did, excellent. Yeah, I'm gonna now. tell you this, if you're not, your dishes are not clean, okay? They're not clean. Let me tell you a story, okay? About 15 years ago, 20 years ago, all detergents, we're made out of phosphates, right? So these little detergents, right? All this stuff was made out of phosphates. You know what phosphates did? They cleaned dishes. And then the environmentalists came along and said, phosphates are bad for the environment. And to some degree, they were correct. But they made all of the uh, dishwashing manufacturers, oh, and the clothing manufacturers take all the phosphates out. Well, if you take all the phosphates, how on earth are you going to get dishes clean when you took out, that's like saying, I want you to take a shower, but you're no longer allowed to use water, right? What are you going to do? Well, they had to come up with a way. So getting dishes clean depends on what are we washing, the mechanical action of the dishwasher, that's only one little part, temperature of the water, which has to be 120 degrees coming into the dishwasher, the quality of the water, so is it hard water, soft water, et cetera, and chemistry. I'm going to give you a chemistry lesson, okay? We took the phosphates out. They had to replace them with something. What did they replace them? You ever wonder why these are all different colors? They're different chemicals, okay? The two that we're going to talk about first, enzymes and bleachers, okay? Now, enzymes go active at 122 degrees. If you're not running hot water, at the sink, before you turn on the dishwasher, you're never gonna activate the enzymes. Now, how many of you have ever made bread? All right, you use yeast. Yeast has to be a certain temperature or yeast doesn't work, right? Same thing with enzymes. These are active little creatures. They're gonna come alive. Now, if you think about it, um, what happens? Let's talk about the dishwasher for a minute. Go back to this slide. Let's just talk about the dishwasher for a minute. What happens when we run a dishwasher? What's the very first thing that happens? Does it fill with water? No, it does not. It turns on the, the, the um, a pump turns on and it sucks all the water out of the sump and refills it with fresh water. And we're going to come back to that idea here in a minute. But as I start to fill the dishwasher with water, hopefully I've run the sink and it's nice and hot. What happens to that water as soon as it hits the dishes, the dishwasher? Okay, uh, it goes, it gets cold. Why? Because the tub is cold. The dishes are cold. The silverware is cold. Okay, a normal cycle for a dishwasher. Now follow me. Hopefully you're watching on, watching me on the screen. Don't don't look at the. Hopefully you you can see my video. Okay. A normal cycle for a dishwasher. We drain and fill, or we, we drain and then we fill. We splash the water around and we drain. And then we fill it up again. We splash the water around and then we drain. And then we fill it up, splash the water around and drain. And then we fill it up, we splash the water around and we drain. 
Let me walk you through this one more time. We fill it up during the pre-rinse cycle and we drain. Then we do the wash cycle. Then we do the next wash cycle. Then we do the rinse cycle. All those cycles are the same. However, during the pre-rinse, when we're dumping in hot water, it hits the cold tub. It hits the cold dishes. So during the pre-rinse, the purpose of the pre-rinse is to warm up the dishes and to warm up the tub. Then we're going to wash, and hopefully by then, the water is hot enough to activate our enzymes. Our enzymes go active at 122 degrees. Now, what do the enzymes do? They basically remove starches, eggs, oatmeals, pasta, things like that. All right? They eat all that stuff, and they get rid of it. Gone. Okay? Now, as we continue to fill and wash, splash the water around and then dump, and then we do it again, the temperature continues to rise. We also have a heater. We have an auxiliary heater. Usually you can either see the heater in the bottom of the, of the tub or sometimes it has an inline heater, right? Where the, the water's passing actually through the heater, the tube. It looks like a toilet paper tube, right? Passes through there and the whole thing, the whole thing is, a, is a heater. The temperatures comes up. When it hits 140 degrees, the bleachers go active, right? Basically the cellulose membrane dissolves around 142 degrees. You know, the first thing the bleachers do, kill the enzymes. <clears throat> no more enzymes, okay? But now the bleachers are going after all the stains, okay? And, and, and they do their thing. And then when they're all said and done, when it's time for the rinse cycle and we wash everything away and, you know, and then we use surfactants to dry. We'll, we'll talk about surfactants in, in a minute, okay? But if the water's not hot enough at the tub or at the tap, it's never going to be hot enough entering, and it's never going to come up to the right temperature to actually activate the detergents. So if you're going to tell your clients one thing, hey, I've never used a dishwasher before, make sure you run the water at the sink. Otherwise, you're basically just washing your dishes with water. People want to know why I never eat potluck dinners. I don't know where those are. Um, for um, you don't really need to look at this slide. Um, basically, the takeaway from this slide is if you've got hard water, you actually need more detergent. And if you have soft water, people that have um, uh, water softeners actually need to use less detergent in their washing machine and their dishwasher. Okay, so it's kind of caveat. Soft water, less detergent. Hard water, more detergent. Okay, now, never ever throw the detergent in the bottom of the dishwasher. Now, a lot of people, they will take this thing, they do their dishes, go on, I want to I want to see, show of hands, how many of you take this little thing and you just throw it in the bottom of the dishwasher? Yeah, a couple of you. Okay, now, we always need to use our dispenser. Okay, here's my little dispenser. I'll turn around like this. I'm going to put my detergent in my little dispenser cup, okay? Now, I start my dishwasher. What's the first fill and dump? That's getting the, everything hot enough, right? I don't want to have detergent sitting in the bottom of the, of the tub when it's not hot enough to activate the ingredients. It's not going to work. So the first, the first cycle is just getting the dishes hot, and just getting the, the tub hot. The second fill and dump, we open up and we dispense our detergent because now our detergent should be hot enough activate those enzymes so we can start cleaning our dishes, okay? And then the third one comes along and we're still washing and we're activating our bleachers and everything is nice and, and great. And then during the last cycle, um, that's when our jet dry, which is a surfactant, that's when it's going to get released during the rinse so that we can get dry dishes, okay? Again, we'll talk about surfactants here in a minute. So. With a dishwasher, you never ever throw the detergent into the bottom of the tub. Now with a washing machine, it's just the opposite. I have not, I've had my washing machine now for, I don't know, five years. I've never once used the dispenser. I use these monodose packets, right? Everyone see the monodose packets? Don't eat it, okay? Not for, not for consumption. Um, I just throw these into the tub. But for a dishwasher, you always have to use the dispenser. All right, now we're gonna to get to my favorite part. This is where it's gonna blow your mind, okay? There's something in your dishwasher called a turbidity sensor. If you have a dishwasher that costs more than four, $500 or 
four hundred dollars, and you've got you've purchased you've got a dishwasher that's less than ten years old. It's got a turbidity sensor. The turbidity sensor is in charge of the whole freaking thing. Okay, it doesn't matter what cycle you select. You are not in charge of your dishwasher. Okay. Now, the turbidity sensor knows what kind of person you are. Okay, now there's three types of people. We're gonna play a game. Just raise your hand when I get to you. Okay, number one, you wash your dishes before you put them in the dishwasher. Raise your hands. All right, yep, we gotta wash those dishes before we put them into the dishwasher. That's number one. Number two, be surprised if we have any number twos. Number two, you scrape your dishes. You go over to the trash or to the bin. You scrape your dishes and then you put them in the dishwasher. Do you have any number twos? I'm a number two. Okay. And then there's number threes. You put everything into the dishwasher, right? Your kids, they just dump the, the cereal with the milk and the leftover Cheerios. They, they dump it all in there. The pasta, the pasta sauce, right? How many number threes? Those are the number threes, right? Okay. So. The manufacturers develop something called the turbidity sensor, and there it is. That's that's it in my hands. Okay, that's what it looks like. There's a diagram on your computer screen. The turbidity sensor is in charge, and it knows whether you're number one, two, or three. Okay, here's how it works. Let me explain. Let me. We're going to call this the nasty sensor. This thing is going to tell me how nasty your water is. Okay, here's how it works. This side, this side's taller because it has a thermistor that's taking temperature. Remember, we're all about temperature. But this side over here has a, it takes voltage and sends it up to an infrared sender. And it sends infrared light across this little gap right here, okay? And then over on this side, it captures the light and turns it back into voltage. And the difference in voltage from one side to the other tells the main board how nasty your water is. Okay, now I told you a regular cycle on, on just about every dishwasher out there, we fill, we wash, and we, and we dump. And then we fill, we wash, we dump four times. That's a normal cycle. If you select, say, um, delicate wash or crystal or something like that, you only have three. If you select a heavy wash, you select like pots and pans, seven. You can add a total of seven times where we're filling, washing, and dumping. Filling, washing, and dumping seven times. We're adding a lot of time, right? But now we've got the nasty sensor to determine whether or not you're a one, two, or three. Now think about it. You select pots and pans, right? because that's just what you do. You select pots and pans. Now, after the first cycle, the turbidity sensor is gonna come on and go, water's pretty clean. I don't need to do, I don't need to do this seven times. So it might eliminate some time. Or maybe you selected normal wash. And after, you know, you're, you're the type three, right? You put everything in. The kids, they dumped everything into the bottom and the nasty sensor comes on and man, man, this is some funk ass nasty water in here. I need to add some more time. So it might add time. The turbidity sensor's in charge. It doesn't matter what, what cycle you select. It doesn't matter what cycle you select because once you hit start, the turbidity sensor is in charge and it's either going to add time or take time away depending on how turbid the water is. Turbidity is how many floaty things are in the water, right? So um, when you have a client say, yeah, what cycle do I use? Just select normal wash. You don't have to select any other cycle because the turbidity sensor is gonna determine whether it needs more time or less time. The other thing is a lot of dishwashers nowadays, they actually have a timer on them. And you might see 90 minutes and then you leave the room for 10 minutes and you come back and it says 110 minutes. It's like, wait a minute, it was gone for 10. It should be down at 80. No, you're a type three. The turbidity said there's some funk nasty water in here. So it added time, it added another cycle to make sure the dishes are clean. Conversely, Maybe you selected the 90 minutes and you're like one of those folks. I saw some of you, y'all wash your dishes before you put it in. You come back 10 minutes later and it might, it might be down to 35 minutes. 
It's like, I don't need all of this. I can run on just three cycles. That's how dishwashers attain energy efficiency. That's why this thing is in charge and it doesn't matter what cycle you select. The turbidity sensor will determine how many times a washer needs to fill and rinse based on how turbid the water is. Does that make sense? Raise your hand if that blew your mind. Yeah, okay. So this is my dishwasher. Stay with me, take a look at the screen. Stop what you're doing, take a look at the screen. This is my dishwasher, okay? I open up my dishwasher, here's my dishes, okay? Now, I'm gonna pull the, I'm gonna do a close up. See down there at the bottom here? This is where my little heater is. That's the heater that will help heat that water in my lower spray arm. And right there, we have a filter. Believe it or not, that filter is supposed to be pulled out once a week and cleaned. Probably none of you have ever done that. So if you look down in there and you got something that looks like this little circular contraption, yeah, turn it 90 degrees, pull it out. Eh, first time you do it, it's probably really funky because you're supposed to do it like yeah, every week. All right, so I'm going to pull mine out. That's my fine filter. Check it out. There's my turbidity sensor. It's, it's like ragu. It's in there. All right. It's in your dishwasher. Okay. And again, if you've never done this, that your filter is going to be funk nasty the first time you do it. But um, once you, once you spray it off again, you just, you just rinse it off in the sink. You might have to pull some, you know, hair and gunk and pasta or whatever out of it. But um, yeah, it's supposed to be done on a regular basis, but down right down there in the sump, there's the turbidity sensor. It's plain as day and it is in charge of your dishwasher. Okay. Now name two things, two things we need to dry dishes. It's pretty easy. Heat and air. Where does the heat come from? It comes from the dishes and it comes from the tub. It comes from the water. When we started talking about dishwashers, the number one thing you could tell your clients before you turn on your dishwasher, turn on the temperature, turn on the tap at the sink and make sure the water's nice and hot, then start the dishwasher. Why? Your dishes will be cleaner. Number two, the, one of the biggest complaints about dishwashers is they don't dry the dishes. Why? Because the water's not hot enough. Because that's where the heat comes from. Okay? The other thing that you need in order to dry dishes, um, um, is the surfactant. Now, what dries better, stainless steel or plastic? Raise your hand. How many people say stainless steel? Come on, raise your hand. How many people say plastic tubs dry better? Yeah, uh, plastic tubs dry infinitely better than stainless steel, okay? Two things you need to dry dishes, heat and air. What does, what does stainless steel do to heat? It absorbs it. It pulls it right out of the air that you're trying to use to dry your dishes, okay? So plastic tubs, um, jet dry, I still always recommend it, but you don't need a lot of it. Stainless steel tubs, if you're not using a rinse aid, your dishes are never going to get dry. If you're not turning on the, the water at the, kitchen, at the kitchen sink and making sure it's hot, your dishes are never gonna get dry. Now, what is, what is finish? You know, if I look at every, every home inspection that I do, just so you know, I leave a free sample of finish and jet dry um, with my business card stapled to it. It's just something that I do. Why? Because I know the people at finish and they send me free samples. Okay. Finish or the, the jet dry. What is jet dry? It's a surfactant. What is a surfactant? A surfactant is a chemical that reduces surface tension of a water molecule. So it'll take the water molecule and spread it out so it can evaporate. Okay. There is jet dry, without jet dry in a stainless steel tub, your, uh, your dishes will not get dry, okay? I just explained what rinse aids do. So, oh, here's something else. Remember we talked about bleachers and enzymes and then surfactants? You know what's in Tide Pods? Enzymes, bleachers, Your laundry detergent's no different than your uh, dishwasher detergent. The same stuff, different concentrations. It's put together slightly different, but your these Mondo those packets that you buy, whether or not it's 
Tide or Parasil or, or you know, all, there's so many different brands. You know what your little detergents are made out of? Bleachers, enzymes, and surfactants. Yeah, they work on your clothes. They work on your, they work on your dishes. Okay, so um, questions about dishwashers. Uh, should I be using the inside? Yes, especially if uh, you have a stainless steel dishwasher. Okay, and it seems to be what new builders like to put in. They love to put in those stainless steel dishwashers. They look really cool. They just don't dry where the damn. Why should I run hot water? I think I beat that one to death. Why doesn't this house have a stainless steel tub dishwasher? You know, you might get a client that, hey, you're selling them a house and they're like, well, my new, my, my current house has a stainless steel dishwasher and this house this has a plastic tub. Hey, now you can tell them why plastic tubs are actually better than stainless steel. Stainless steel looks high end, but plastic tubs dry infinitely better. Okay. Um, can I throw detergent at the bottom of the tub? No. With a dishwasher, you have to use the dispenser because we don't want to dispense that detergent too early before it can activate the ingredients, you know, um, once the water's hot enough. I think my dishwasher's broken. Do you know why it's adding time to the cycle? Yeah, because you've got funk nasty water and the turbidity sensor is saying, I want to make sure that the dishes are clean. Okay, because people still hold the manufacturer responsible based on, I mean, the, the manufacturer doesn't know what you're putting in your dishwasher. Um, they don't know, you know, um, what kind of food you're putting in there. They don't know if you're cooking in your dishwasher. What? Go on Google, you can find so many recipes of how you can cook with your dishwasher. My favorite is fish. And I'll tell you why. The sanitize cycle, if you select the sanitize cycle, this sounds gross, but I've, I'm, hundreds of thousands of people are doing it in the United States. If you have a sanitize cycle in your dishwasher, sanitize cycle means that that little thermistor, okay? Remember one side of the turbidity sensor was higher, okay? This little thermistor right here, if it gets to 100, between 152 and 157 degrees, the little light turns on saying it's sanitized. You know what the optimal temperature is for fish? 150 to 155 degrees. So you can start your dishes and then on the top rack, and if you don't believe me, just Google it and you'll be like, holy shit, this kid was right. Um, yeah, you can take a piece of fish and wrap it up in tin foil, a little, little olive oil, a uh, little spices, you do your dishes, and when your dishes are done, dinner's ready. And then what happens if I open the door before the cycle is done? Well, you're gonna let out all the hot air and then your dishes are not gonna get dry. Any questions about dishwasher? Yes, uh, I've got a couple here, Jim. Um, <laughs> Vomit, I love it. So if I use the pod, should I stop putting liquid finish in the little well in the door or will it dry my dishes just twice as fast? Um, no, you should always use, you should always use, um, if, wait, if you stop using Tide, what? Tide is for your washing machine. If you use the pods, should I stop putting liquid finish in the little well in the door? No, that's the surfactant. No, that's this, no, that's this, um, your, your little things have some, but you wanna make sure the jet dry is filled. So in the, in the dispenser, if I open this up and fill it, if I fill it to the top, which is this reservoir underneath, um, usually lasts about 30 days. So every 30 days, you wanna make sure that you fill that so that you have always have jet dry in there so that you have a better chance of your dishes getting dry. All right, the pump that drains my dishwasher just stopped working. Should I just buy a new one? Please say yes. Yes. A good time. I'd fix it, but um, it depends on what kind of money you have. Um, if you want to uh, a service call for a, for a washer pump, yeah, look about one hundred and forty dollars, one hundred and sixty dollars. So, if you want to spend five hundred on a new dishwasher, just go get a new dishwasher. That's cool. Your favorite brand of dishwasher? Frigidaire. Not Whirlpool, huh? Well, I worked for Frigidaire for 11 years. Like I said, as the national training manager, you could hand me a box of parts for a Frigidaire dishwasher and I could pretty much build it blindfolded. That's how well I know Frigidaire products. Especially so, turbidity sensors. Especially the turbidity right. sensor. I know, I told you I get passionate about some of this stuff. I like it. Um, 
and can't someone can't seem to find their filter in the dishwasher it's, it's in the bottom right you already went in the bottom that. yeah most dishwashers have them some lower end units don't but again if it's a higher end unit uh, you know like i said and when i say higher end i'm talking a 500 dollar price point or higher generally speaking it's there um i point this out i am one of those home inspectors i'm gonna tell you a little bit about my company next okay tell you a little bit about galaxy properties with perfect segue um, I am one of those inspectors. I like agents to attend my home inspections. I like customers to be there because not only do I like to show you, if I find a deficiency, I like to show it to you. We can talk about it right on the spot. Um, but also I like to educate folks. I like to show them, hey, here's where all of your GFIs reset. All your bathrooms might be tied together. You know, um, a lot of new um, ranges, you can actually remove the door and it's really easy to make cleaning easier. Um, I like to talk through all of that stuff. So um, that's one of those things that, you know, I like to educate folks while they are, while they're there, because it just makes their life easier, not to mention they're spending a lot of money for that house. They may as well know what they're buying. Okay. So a little bit about me. And then if you want, we can take a quick break. It's up to you. Um, we're, we're doing good on time. Um, I'm going to, I'll probably end up still finishing right around 315. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, when you call me, uh, for an inspection, I'm the one that shows up. It's just me, myself, and I. Um, I do buyers inspections, sellers. I do a pre-listing walk and talk. This is for people that are going to put their house on the market, meaning it's not on the market yet. I will do a walk and talk. It doesn't include a written report, and I take 50% off the price. And I do this quite frequently. People call me up. I'm thinking about selling my home. You know, um, right on. I only charge $75. Um, and, if, and that's with a home inspection. If it's just the rate on inspection and not a home inspection, I charge more. I'm an FAA um, pilot, so I have a drone. I'm licensed, to, you know, um, I do aerial photography. I use my drone a lot. I use my drone probably on eight out of 10 inspections. I don't charge when I do it. I want to see the roof. There's some home inspectors that will say roof not accessible. I mean, these tall and skinnies and some of these houses with these pitched roofs that are like this, home inspectors won't climb up there. I still, hey, it's my responsibility to look at it. So I have a drone and I love to fly it. I was a helicopter pilot in the army. So playing with the drone is kind of fun. And I do have online scheduling. So if you get an email, I can send you an email and you can schedule online. You, don't, you can schedule a home inspection with me without ever calling me because you can do it online. Uh, you can see my availability. You can see the price before you hit confirm. I'm very transparent with my pricing. Um, I'm pretty cheap, uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm low quality. The one, the one thing that I hear a lot is that I'm incredibly meticulous, but I'm not, I don't sensationalize things. I'm pretty much, I'm pretty real. Okay. Um, you can see my pricing. Now, I sometimes, depending on where it is, I charge mileage, but uh, generally speaking, um, if it's, you know, Less than 1,800 square feet in Nashville, Murfreesboro, Brentwood, Franklin, be $200 plus a processing fee, which is 206. Okay. Um, like I get said, I love to have agents and clients at my inspections because I feel you get more out of it, and I guarantee my reports. I don't think I've ever had a report that I didn't have published no later than the next morning by 7 a.m. So Monday, this past Monday, two days ago, three days ago, I don't even know what day it is. I did three inspections on Monday. Every report was published by 6 a.m. the next day. So that's just kind of my thing. I get, I get them done and get them out. So if I do an inspection today, by the time you wake up tomorrow, you'll have the, you'll have the report. Okay. Um, Tim, it's up to you. Do you want to? Yep. Uh, Teddy, excuse me. Do you want people to take a break or? Do we need that? Raise your hand if you need a four minute break. All right, let's take a uh, let's take a uh, four minute break. It's two twenty three. We're going to come back at two twenty seven. Two twenty seven. And uh, Jim, do you have a center card, by the way? No, I don't. I need one. All right, um, we'll get... Usually, I just text people. Hey, can you send me a one day code? And I've never really had a problem with it. Perfect. Okay. Ways around that for sure. All right, two twenty seven. We'll be back. Okay. And if you have any. Direct questions for Jim. I'm sure he'd be happy to field those. Yeah, if you got any questions, now's a great time to ask him. Do not take your camera to your uh, dishwasher filter. He's not interested in that. <laughs> but he might like to see your turbidity sensor. I'm not sure. So. Yeah. 
Hey, uh, Jim, I'm the one with all the broken appliances. I'm sorry, um, Rebecca. <laughs> thanks. Um, they're they're all bought at the same time, and they're all going yeah. out now. Um, Should have had a home so, warranty. Appliances are covered under a home warranty. Yeah, I don't have a home warranty. So call and get one. Now that's dishonest, Jim. Come on. Are you kidding? Uh, over half the people that have home warranties, yeah, they call, and then that's. Trust me, that's what people do. I was in the business for 18 years. I know how it works. Well, I believe you. But here's well, my question. Half, half here's the question. people voted for somebody different than me, but just because those half Joe's didn't say who, didn't say who. <laughs> so back to this pump, sump pump thing that's not pumping at all. Okay. So with a service call, and I'm going to guess having, it's going to need a new pump. I mean, it's not pumping, nope. right? Well, you still think that's going to be, you know, or should be, I? You know, but here's so the thing: it could be the pump, it could be the board, it could be the main board. Here's what I would tell you to do first. Okay, do a power on reset to your dishwasher. Okay, so go kill the power. Do you know if it plugs in under the sink? I don't know if it plugs in under the sink. I know where it goes into the disposal. Okay, that doesn't help you. I just um, need to unplug so, it if I can. Yes, or kill the power at the breaker for a minimum of two minutes. Okay. Okay, so kill the power at the breaker, go over and check it and make sure that it's off. All right, for a minimum of two minutes, I'd suggest maybe three. Then turn it back on, then try to, you know, try maybe run a small, um, you know, run it. It might be the board is not communicating with the pump. And by doing a power on reset, you reboot the board um, I had a refrigerator issue the other day, a no cool, and she rebooted her refrigerator and she called, uh, it was a client and she texted me back and said it worked. So she didn't have to call with a text. So you might try that first reboot your dishwasher. Didn't bet you didn't know you could do that. If that doesn't work, then if you call a technician out, they're probably going to charge you, you know, somewhere between 65 and $120 for a service call and then parts. So how old is your dishwasher? Do you know? Yeah. Yes. It's eight years. Um, yeah, I'd fix it. But again, it's, it's how much money do you want to spend? You can spend $200 to fix it. Or you can spend $500 for a new one. Right. It's up to you. Yeah. What else is broken? My ice maker. Oh yeah. What kind of, what kind of product? Whirlpool, Whirlpool? and Whirlpool. And Whirlpool. All is Whirlpool. it in the fresh food section or the freezer? The freezer section. Oh, that's plug and play. Those are, yeah, you can, to tell you the truth, you can probably find that part online um, and order it yourself. And if, I mean, if you're handy, you can replace it yourself. It's literally, it hangs on two screws that you just loosen, unhang it. There's a wire harness behind it. You just unplug it and then take your new one, plug it in and rehang it. And I mean, if you're, if you're handy uh, or if you have a significant other who's handy, you may want to do that. Um, you can go to marcone.com, reliableparts.com, um, V&V appliancepartscom They will all have, you know, as long as you have your model and serial number, they'll sell you the ice maker mm -hmm. and you can replace it yourself or you can call a technician that come out and do it for you. So the issue is when I, it, uh, I, I turn, what, it's off right now. When I turn it on and it goes to fill the tray, it just goes straight through and fills up and it just keeps going until it overflows onto the floor. Oh, well, then that's not your ice maker. <laughs> it's your water valve. Yeah, it sounds like it's a cylinder. I would guess it's a cylinder. It could be a solenoid issue with your water valve. So your water valve has four solenoids, all right? The water comes in, then it leaves and goes to your water filter. Then it comes back from your water filter and then goes to the ice maker. Your water is passing through four solenoids. And if any one of those, if that last solenoid is stuck and it's stuck open, it will cause your ice maker to constantly refill. Try rebooting your refrigerator too and see if see what that does. If not, I would go with the service call because it's going to be a whole lot cheaper than buying a new unit. Are we ready to go? We're ready to rock and roll. Let's do right. this. Washing machines. You've got two different kinds, top loads, front loads. There's a lot of people that prefer top loads over front loads. Front loads, wash your clothes infinitely better than top loads. 
Okay, let's talk about top loads first. Okay, so here's my top load washing machine. I wonder why my graphics not working. <laughs> the graphics stuck. Um, top loads generally use between 13 to 45 gallons of water, depending on how old they are. Um, and they, they tumble the clothes through. And the, I bet you didn't know this, the capacity of the washer is determined by the size of the agitator. Now, for those of us that have been around a long time, okay, remember we used to buy, you know, everyone had a Kenmore or a Whirlpool or something. By the way, um, who makes who makes Kenmore wash front top load? Oh, that's right, it's Whirlpool. They're the same company. Okay, so everybody makes Kenmore. So LG makes Kenmore, GE makes Kenmore, uh, Frigidaire makes Kenmore, everybody makes Kenmore. Anyway, we used to have washing machines that would really be like king capacity and super capacity, and ultra capacity. That just determined how big the agitator was because the smaller the agitator, the more room there was for clothes. Now they've gotten rid of agitators because it's all about capacity. You know, we want you to be able to do more clothes. So now they pretty much, they don't even have agitators anymore. They got a little wave plate at the bottom, which moves the water around, okay? But again, 13 to 45 gallons. Now you got a front load washer. They use between six to 13 gallons. That's it. And that's like the pre-rinse, the wash, and the, and the, uh, the rinse at the end. Um, and they and here's the thing. People have been laughing at me for years. But I think of a front load washer as an electric pilgrim. Now think about this. I know Ann's looking at me like, what's this kid smoking? OK. So pilgrims use, how did they used to wash their clothes? Think about it. They take their clothes down to the creek, right? They get them wet and they beat them against rocks. You with me? Everybody just nod. Yeah, he's, he's nuts. Okay. How does, the dish, how does the front load work? By tumbling those clothes and smacking them down in the water to beat the dirt out of your clothes. The biggest problem we have with front load waters out there or front load uh, uh, washing machines is people overload them. If those clothes can't tumble and splash in the water, they're not gonna get clean. You can't just cram it full, as full as it can be and think it's gonna get clean with six to 13 gallons of water, okay? If somebody asks you, how do you load this thing? You loosely throw in clothes until it's about three quarters of the way full and that's it. You don't take the, the basket and pour it over and kind of push it all and jam it all in there as hard as you can. No, it will ne your clothes will never get clean. Okay, um, front load washers do have a higher cleanability scores than top load washers. That's industry industry wide. They 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 clean better. Okay, um, some people don't like them because they smell. All right, and they get you you know um, you have when you're done you kind of have to leave the door open so that the inside of the washing machine can dry out because mold can grow. And when I tell you why mold grows, ooh, you're all gonna go ew because again I'm about to blow your mind again. You thought the turbidity sensor was bad. What brand is the most reliable? Now take a look at your screen. What don't we want? Um, yeah, we don't want uh, bells and whistles, okay? They make washing machines out there that have like 50 different cycles. You don't need that. You need warm and cold. You don't even need hot. Um, and you need like small, medium, and large. So somebody asks you what kind I get, just stick with the basics. All right. You don't have to get these Samsung units with the, you know, the glass front with the wash basket in there and all that other garbage. That's just more stuff to break. All right. You don't need a lot of bells and whistles when it comes to a washing machine. Okay. Um, and you should be washing your clothes really on warm or cold. Don't even use hot. I'll tell you another. I'll tell you another um, uh, urban myth. Everybody thinks that your clothes shrink in the dryer. It's not true. Clothes shrink in the washing machine. Um, and they shrink when you use hot water. You know why? Because the hot water makes all those, it takes the fibers that are in your clothes and the hot water brings them all together. And when they bring them all together, your clothes are actually smaller. And then when you stick it in the dryer, they dry in place. Yeah, your dryer doesn't shrink your clothes. Washing in hot water does. Okay, keep it simple, keep it easy to use. And also, if you're keeping it simple, it also makes it easy to repair, okay? People ask me all the time, what's the best thing out there? I tell them, stay in about a $600 price point. You're gonna get a washer that's gonna clean your clothes just fine. You don't need a $1,000 
you know, or a twelve hundred or fifteen hundred dollar washing machine. It's just got too much stuff. Now, you just, but when you have a washing machine, whether it's front load or top load, you have to run cleaner through your machine. Okay, this is where this is where the first time I taught this class, Teddy was like, "What? You have to run cleaner through your machine." Okay, now this is I'm going to show you two pictures. It's the same washing machine. Okay, take a look at the picture on your screen. That is the spin basket. That is what you see. What you don't see is what the spin basket is sitting in. It is sitting in the tub. That is not the tub, that is the spin basket. The spin basket sits in the tub. The tub holds the spin basket, it holds the water, right? What's on the other side of that spin basket? Same machine. Yeah, that's all the dirt and funk left over from you know, our bodies. I mean, if you think about it, we all sweat. We have oils, we have dirt. I mean, that's why we wash our clothes. Doesn't mean just because the spin basket is nice and clean, doesn't mean that underneath is clean. Now, this probably has never happened to you before, but it's happened to me, where I've run a load of laundry, like a load of whites, and I get some random mystery stain that just shows up out of nowhere. And I start checking, and I'm like, what, did I leave a pen or something? You know, where, what, 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 what's going on? No, it's I need to run cleaner through my machine to get all that nasty stuff off the bottom of the tub and out of the, uh, off the back of the spin basket. The same machine. So we got to run cleaner, okay? When we run cleaner, we're also going to remove molds and, and, and stuff from, you know, uh, from our machine. Now, there's all different kinds of cleaners that you can use out there. The thing that should be glaring at you, my favorite cleaner, is Tang Instant Breakfast Drink. I've been using it for over 15 years, okay? Now, what are, now remember, our detergents, they're not made out of phosphates anymore. We got enzymes, we've got bleachers, we have surfactants, and then of course you all like to use um, uh, fabric softener. How many of you use fabric softener? Raise your hands, I wanna see, I wanna count hands. Do you use fabric softener? That includes bounce, like fabric sheets. Yeah, you all do. You know you do. Okay, We're, just remember that for a minute. Um, at the end of this, you'll probably never want to use them again. But Tang is just citric acid. Citric acid will break up the emollients and all the coagulants and things that are left over from the detergents and wash them out of your machine. I use this once a month religiously. I buy one of these containers, open it up. I put half in my washing machine. I put the other half in my dishwasher. I turn them on the hot cycle and I go to bed. Next morning, my machines are nice and clean because this will break down all the funk that's hiding in the spray arms of your dishwasher, um, in the wash tubes in your dishwasher, um, underneath the basket, in my front load washer, etc. I'm not kidding. People think that I'm kidding. I've been using this for over 15 years. Okay, learned it from us, learned it from a technician out in the field. Okay, um, so um, oh, going the wrong way here. Okay, so um, one thing about front load washers, again, some people don't like, like them, you know, you have to keep the door open in between the cycle. You need to remove the laundry right away. You cannot wash clothes and then leave them in there. If anybody ever had a front load washer and you forgot and you left your laundry in there and you, you left it overnight, and then you put it in the dryer and it's like, mm, kind of smells funky, kind of smells moldy. Yeah, yeah, that's because of your, um, that's because of your, uh, um, your fabric softener, okay? And it doesn't matter if you're using downy or snuggle or bounce sheets, it's from your fabric softener. We'll talk about that here in, in just a second, okay, which direction I'm going. Okay. <laughs> Take a look at the screen and let's say these together, okay? Talodimethyl ammonium chloride and dipolmethyl hydrocethylonium methyl sulfate, okay? What are these things, okay? Those are the two common ingredients that you will find in fabric softeners. If you go get your downy right now, one of those two will be either number one or two as far as the ingredients goes. If you use um, bounce sheets, yeah, you're gonna find that as well. Now, remember when you use bounce, either but you know the fabric sheets or any kind of fabric sheets um, um, for fabric softener, that leaves a coating on your clothes. 
And then that stuff comes out the next time you wash, right? Now, where do we get these things? See, in balance, downy, snuggle, gain, doesn't matter. The question is, where do they come from? Well, they come from boiled down animal fat. Boiled down animal fat is the primary ingredient in fabric softeners. And it doesn't matter if you're using the bounce sheets or the downy or the snuggle. Yeah, it comes from boiled down animal fat. Just so you know, fabric softener is about 80% animal fat, 10% wax, and 10% fragrance. And those silly beads that they now sell, that's just more wax. Why do you want to put wax on your clothes? Your clothes are number one, they're never going to be able to breathe. Uh, if any of you have you ever used like too many bounce sheets in your in your um, wash uh, or in your when you're in the dryer or you use too much fabric softener, you know, like your towels, they can get like this waxy feeling. Yeah, that's because you coated them with animal fat and wax. Gross. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is, um, you know what mold, like mold that grows like in your front load washer and creates that bad smell? Um, mold needs a food source. You know what the mold's eating? It's eating the animal fat, just so you know. So if you're using fabric softener, you're actually feeding mold that can grow in your washing machine. <laughs> so my washer will not drain, okay? Generally speaking, um, right there or right down here. Um, can you see my cursor moving on the screen by chance? You can? Okay, yeah, so it's either right down here in most front loads or sometimes they put it down here. There's a clean out, it's called a coin catch. Generally the manufacturer's warranty does not cover things that are put in the machine or that they did not put in the machine. So bra underwires, those are a big one. Baby socks, plastic items. I'm actually guilty of this myself. You stay in a hotel and they you know, use those little plastic um, keys you know, that look like a credit card, or maybe you just left, you know, maybe you left a card in your, in your uh, pants pocket or something, and it comes out, it gets down the coin catch. Um, yeah, those are not covered under your home warranty. So if you have a client that, you know, I mean, you're all very seasoned realtors, and you would never sell a house without a home warranty, right? Um, yeah, those things, if a service call has to, if somebody has to come out and run a service call because somebody's jammed up your pump and the thing is not draining and your washing machine's not working and it turns out they found keys or an underwire or baby socks or you know, whatever, um, or, or bounce fabric sheets um, that will screw up the pump in the washing machine, they're not, that's not covered under warranty, okay? Um, now people ask, how does a bounce fabric, wait, you use bounce in the dryer. Yes, but it's, again, it's probably never happened to you before, but every once in a blue moon, I'll put on a hoodie and I find a bounce fabric sheet that's in the hood, or I put on a long sleeve shirt and it's like, wait, why, why is my sleeve inching? And I reach up in my sleeve and I pull out a bounce fabric sheet that got stuck in there. Yeah, that can actually happen. And you know, or you didn't find it and you took your clothes off and you throw them back in the wash and now the bounce sheet gets into the washing machine and it gets in there and it screws up all the inside workings. Believe it or not, this stuff happens. It happens a whole lot more than you think. So um, the other thing, I get asked this question a lot, new construction in Nashville, more and more so I'm finding as a home inspector, I find uh, drain pans that are installed in laundry rooms, especially in new construction. Most, a lot of places in the country now, drain pans are code. Okay, that is so that and there it's a drain pan and then it connects to a drain. So if the dish or if the washing machine starts to leak, it'll catch in the pan and go down the drain, especially in second floor laundry rooms. All right, if you have a second floor laundry room, it, the washing machine really should be in a pan. Okay, the biggest problem with pans is that installers, they don't know how to get that 340 pound washing machine into the pan without cracking the pan. Okay, I'll tell you the secret is a three foot four by four. You put a four by four up against it, and then that will actually support the weight of the machine as you're actually putting it back into the pan. But that's, in the, that's a different subject. Um, so if you see pans, if you see new construction and there's a drain in the floor of what's gonna be the laundry room, it's for a laundry drain pan, because again, more municipalities are changing over to making pans code. It's pretty much code all through um, the Northeast. Um, so 
Okay. But, but make sure it drains to the exterior. Make sure. Make sure it, yeah, yeah. Make sure. It most of them, you'll see plenty of pans that drain nowhere. So yep. just look, look down the hole and make sure it goes somewhere. Yeah. Pull the pan aside and see if there was a built-in drain. It could. A lot of times they'll put the pan and they just forget to connect it. Um, okay. What's better, top load or front load? Guess it depends on what you like. I prefer to front load because they wash better. What washing machines use less water? That would be front loads. What kind of detergent should I be using? You know, you really uh, suggest to your customers that they use the monodose packets. That is what this is called. It's called a monodose packet. I never use the dispenser. The dispenser has like a minimum and maximum line in there. Using more detergent doesn't mean cleaner clothes. Just so you know, this little Tide Pod, uh, this is enough to do a regular load of laundry. Now, if I'm doing like a full load of jeans or a full load of towels, I use two of these. I never use more than two. Generally speaking, I just use one. That's enough. Filling up that thing, yeah, that's, uh, it, it, you're just wasting detergent. The detergent manufacturers actually pay the appliance manufacturers to put the minimum and maximum line on there. If the appliance manufacturers are not getting kickbacks from an appliance from a, a detergent company, they don't put them on anymore. Okay, what brand is most reliable? It depends on what you want. Uh, I like to keep it simple. So, okay, dryers. Any questions about washing machines? Yeah, real on. quick, uh, can I can I use bleach to clean my washer? Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Put it through the cycle or dump it in the in the in the bin. That I would that I would, if you're going to use bleach, I would put it in the dispenser. Great. Is self-clean cycle good to use or just a regular cycle with hot water? But they're both the same. The self-clean cycle is basically it's just it's the longest, hottest cycle that the washing machine will do. Does the cold cycle melt the pod membrane? Yes. Water Wait. melts the pod membrane. And That's why I said it's the same ingredients. They're just built different. Yeah, it's just the cellulose breaks down at different temperatures. That's all it is. And includes saliva. All right, can you repeat <laughs> the tang process one more time? <laughs> That's right. The tang process, yes. I buy one of these. I put half of it in the washing machine. I put the other half in the dishwasher. Run them on the hottest cycle. So I'll select, um, you know, my sanitize cycle on my washing machine, which runs for maybe two hours, okay? And it, it, it mixes up the tang while it's in there and it washes all around and it kill it, it, it I'll tell you what, it cleans like a champ. Like I can it. tell you story after story about people that have come back to me and said, I cannot believe that works. Okay. Yeah. And I personally have been doing it for over 15 years. So. Uh, is off fresh a better cleaner than plain bleach? Yes, because off fresh, you know what is, you know what it is? It's citric acid. You know what tang is? Citric acid. Yeah, our right. fresh just costs more. There you go. I ordered my uh, Tang through Amazon Fresh, by the way. That's one of the go. first times I've used Amazon Fresh, but I ordered like six of those babies to put it uh, into rental property and into to mine. There you so go. I haven't even done it yet. I've been pushing it for uh, for weeks now. I haven't, I haven't done even it tried it yet. I'm gonna, I, I do it religiously. Gonna I just did it last week. I know it's going to work. That's why I have an empty container here. Um, okay, dryers. Three things you need to dry clothes. Now, remember, when we were drying dishes, we needed heat and air. To dry clothes, we need heat, air, and mechanical action, meaning those clothes actually have to tumble. This is why we don't want to overload the washing machine, because if we overload the washing machine, we're going to end up overloading the dryer. And if those, if those um, clothes can't tumble freely, they're not going to get dry. Okay. Um, three wire hookups. People ask me this all the time about 240. All right, 240, all that means is that it's just got, or, you know, uh, the 220 volt uh, plug that a washing machine or a range plug into. Think about it, it's just two outlets combined into one. One outlet is 110, right? Two outlets is 220. So we've got a black wire that runs to one side, and that's basically, um, just so you know, no, the, the black wires, generally speaking, is all the electronics like the push buttons and the motors and things like that. The red wire is still the same amount of electricity and that's going to the heating elements. That's why if you have a 240 um, uh, dryer, half of the electricity is for the heating elements. The other half is for everything else, 
All right. And sorry, I keep going the wrong way with this silly scroll scroll wall. One ten. Okay, so there is no such thing as a dryer that is sold uh, or a, a, a electric dryer that is sold with the plug attached. They don't. Every manufacturer just sells you the dryer. They don't come with a plug. Why? Because every house is different and every house has a different plug. So your client might say, my current dryer has a three prong plug and this house that you're selling me has a four prong plug. Okay, just put a new plug on it. This, it's called a pigtail. We, I mean, they're, they're all the same, okay? So this one at the top right, right? All right, we've got this. This would be the, the 110. The top would be 110. This would be the neutral. And this round one would be the ground. So we got 110, 110. There's our 220, all right? Our neutral and our ground. Down here, 110, 110, our neutral. So the shape of an L shape and a ground. Over here, we've got 110, 110, and then this thing is the ground and neutral combined. They tie the neutral and ground together. It's still gonna work. I can take the same dryer and put any one of these plugs on it and the dryer will work just fine, as long as it you know, corresponds with the plug that's in the wall. And there's no rhyme or reason as to what or what builders, what plug they use. I guess it's just whatever's cheaper, okay? Gas dryers, all right, if I'm inspecting a home and it has a gas dryer, I still have to have 110 plug there because the, again, it needs 110 volts to work all of the components like the motor and the electronics and what have you. But the heating element in this case would be gas, natural gas. Don't find that too often, but once in a while I do. Okay, proper venting. This is something that I look for as a home inspector. Sometimes I write this up and people are like, yeah, you're being a little, you know, Hey, if the vent is too long, it flat out will not work, okay? Most dryers that are out there, the longest that the vent can run is 64 feet. Now you might think, wow, that's a long way. However, every time there is a 90 degree bend, you have to reduce 10 feet. So take a look at this, take a look at your screen. The one that says correct, that's a 25 foot vent. All right, now look, it comes out of the back of the dryer and just goes right up the wall and out. And it doesn't come up too much past the dryer. We all know a dryer is 36 inches tall, right? But we come out and we have to add 10 feet. So there's, you know, a foot and then 10, so we're up to 11. And then we got four foot rise. That's 15 and then another 10 and then out. So it's like 26 feet. That's the way it's calculated in the industry. This one over here, yeah, uh, that's a disaster. I mean, that's what that's coming out. We got a half bends. We'll add five feet there. And then we got one, two, three, four bends there. So we're up to 45, 46. And then we're coming up another 40. That's 50. And then we got another bend here. That's 60. You know, yeah, this little curly Q thing. That's the equivalency of 60 feet straight line. Where you'll see this, this uh, where you'll see this, um, sometimes when you're selling new construction condos in a building, they may supply the dryer. It's because code required them for fire purposes to supply the dryers to make sure they were what you hear called long vent dryers. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you'll see that call to make sure if you're selling a condo that you um, ask the inspector to check, is it a long vent dryer? Uh, they won't be able to know how many bends are within the structure of the building to discharge that dryer. Unless but, it's in uh, the crawl space, unless there's a crawl space. Yep, but in those condos, uh, you'll want to most likely need a long vent dryer. Yep. So this is something else I see all the time. It's my biggest pet peeve, okay? The people that use that white, um, this dryer venting, the white vinyl venting, white vinyl venting was never meant to use for dryers. That's soffit vent. That's venting for your bathroom. The white vinyl, that's bathroom venting. That's what it's used for. Yet I see it, people that still have it hooked up in dryers. It's against fire code, just about everywhere now. Um, and it's a fire hazard. So I will write it up if I see it. Um, most of the time now people use that flexible foil stuff. It's not the best. Really what you should be using is, is metal flex. This is actually metal, but it's, it's, it's semi-rigid flexible. Right, that's the preferred, you know, um, 
method for hooking up dryers. But if I see it hooked up to vinyl, the other day I saw a, a dryer up in North Nashville had the whole gambit. It was hooked up to white, uh, it was hooked up to metal, then it went to metal flex, and then underneath, because of where they were running it, it was half of it was flexible foil, and then it went to uh, vinyl. <laughs> like they used, they used everything that they could. Um, and then it terminated in the crawl space and was blowing lint everywhere. The crawl space was ugh, disgusting, but okay. Which one of those do you think we can use? Everybody take a look. Which one of those, when it comes to that, where, as a home inspector, what am I looking for? Because I see all of these, and you probably have seen all of these walking around houses. Yeah, those are all wrong. You can't use, the only one that I really want to see is the louvered ones. Okay. Um, anything with a grate is just going to catch the lint. It's eventually going to clog, and it can, it can be a fire hazard. And... These ones with these, this one that's down here in the left, I don't know if any of you follow me on Facebook. I just ran into this and I did a post about this two days ago. I did an inspection uh, in Thompson Station. In fact, I just went there today and picked up my radon machine. Um, it was a sell, it was an inspection. The sellers were there and normally I never talk to a seller. I mean, I'll be friendly with a seller, but I never talk about my inspection with a seller. But in this case, I went and got the seller and brought him outside and said, do you see, take a look at your dryer vent. It was smoking. It was getting ready to catch on fire. And I climbed up there. With, I don't really don't fix the deficiencies either as a home inspector. I just write them down. But in this case, I crawled up there with a ladder and I pulled out. I mean, it was hot. It was smoking. I pulled out a bird's nest that was stuck in one of those flappers because birds easily get in and out of there. I pulled out this giant bird's nest that was caked with lint on the one side but literally, I mean, the thing was ready to catch on fire. And the guy was extremely thankful. And again, I only talked to a seller about my inspection if it's, you know, we're in a dangerous situation. You know, like I caught a gas leak a week ago. We had to get the gas company out there and fix it. Um, but really, the moral of the story is I just want to see the louvers. The louvers are really, they're the what works best. You never want to see grates because grates are just there. Those are fire hazards waiting to happen. Okay. Why do my clothes take so long to dry? It's probably the vent is too long. A lot of times, again, we need air, we need, we need mechanical action, we need heat. If that vent is too long or if there's too many curly cues or if the end of the, of the, the exhaust, the dryer exhaust all clogged up with lint, it's gonna increase um, dry times. What's better, gas or electric? Believe it or not, gas. Gas uh, dryers actually are much more, uh, they, they dry clothes faster and more efficiently. Um, they're just not real prevalent in this area. Um, why does the dryer plug have three prongs? Because it does. Because that's what that's the kind of plug that was there. If you're moving your dryer to a new house, it's got a four prong plug. Pull off the three prong pigtail. Put on a four prong. It's okay. Can I use cheap vinyl venting? Uh, yes, to run from a bathroom vent to a soffit. You never use it for dryers. And there is portion says the vent cover needs to be replaced. What type should I use? We want to use the ones. Okay, any questions about dryers? Can I vent a dryer through the floor and into the crawl space? Well, you, you can run it down through the crawl space, but it needs to terminate to the outside. You do not want to fill the crawl space with lint. That can become a fire hazard. But as long as you're running it through, yeah, I, and I see that all the time where they've run it through the crawl space and it's nice and supported and it runs out to an exhaust vent. And that's, that's perfectly okay. Um, any, anything else? Anything else on dryers? We're almost done. And I appreciate your time today. I really do. Gas and electric ranges, great. Right? We'll quickly get this and yeah, I'm, I'll even finish early even though we started late. Okay, electric and gas ranges. <clears throat> the difference between preheat and quick preheat. Okay, I just saw a range the other day that had quick preheat. People ask me, you know, what is that? Quick preheat is for the air. When you preheat an oven, it's not, it's not for the air inside an oven. When you preheat an oven, you're heating the oven liner. Okay, now think about it. There's quick preheat and rapid preheat. Basically, they'll turn on the heating elements and in five minutes, the dinger will go off and they'll say, hey, the oven's preheated. It's really not. Preheating an oven 
is to bring the liner, the oven liner, and the oven racks up to temperature. People think it's just, oh, I'm gonna set it at 350 and when, it, when it's preheated, the air inside the, the oven is 350. No, that's completely wrong. Um, preheat is for the oven liner and for the racks. In fact, I'll tell you this, if you turn on your oven and you set it at 350, your oven is almost never at 350. Never at 350. 350, we're hoping, is the average temperature because the heating elements are either on or they're off. Now, when you set it at 350 and turn it on, the heating elements are going to come on, right? And they're going to heat that temperature at 200, 300, 350, 375, around 375 or 380, they turn off. And the temperature will cool down and it'll cool down to about 335, give or take. And then they'll come back on and it'll heat up again to about 370, 380. Then it'll turn off. It'll come back down to about 340, 335. And it will keep doing that. Your, your temperatures in your oven are constantly going up and down depending on if the heating element's on or off. The average that we're looking for is 350, okay? So that's the difference between preheat. Preheat is, quick preheat is just Five to, after five to seven minutes, it dings and says, hey, you know, we're, we've reached a temperature and it's never going to be close to 350. Quick preheat's usually, you might, you might reach about 225 with a quick preheat. Preheat, the reason why it takes 15 to 20 minutes, generally speaking, with an oven, it's not the air. We're trying to preheat, the, bring the oven liner up to temperature. And the reason for that is if you just preheated the air, the minute you opened up the oven to put in your turkey or your pie, or your cookies, if you're somebody after my own heart, um, you let all the air out. Because the minute you open the door, if the oven liner is not up to temperature, all the hot air is going to come out and all the cold air from the kitchen is going to go in. However, because of the thermal properties of the way ovens are built, if you preheat the oven and the oven is brought up to temperature, when you open up the door, the hot air stays in. That's why you preheat an oven. It's not about the air, it's about the oven liner. <coughs> Go figure. Okay, cleaning the top of a range, you never ever use Windex. Yes, people call it a glass top range. It is not a glass top range, okay? It is um, tempered ceramic. So one of the biggest misconceptions uh, about there, even though you can see through it, you can see the element, it's not a glass top range. That glass that you think is, we just call it glass as a generic term. It's tempered ceramic. Uh, Windex will destroy it because of the ammonia in Windex. If you constantly sprain your, um, your glass top range, okay, your tempered ceramic range, yeah, the Windex will actually start to pit the tempered ceramic and eventually the ceramic will crack. So what do you use to clean it? Um, I use a razor blade and an approved cleaner, all right? I like the paste cleaners because they work so much better. I use a razor blade and they, they make, the, this is how the manufacturers will teach you how to clean a, uh, the top of a uh, glass ceramic range. Um, take a razor blade, um, they actually make holders for them and you use that to kind of scrape off the big stuff. I mean, you're not cutting the glass, you're just kind of, you know, gently scraping off, you know, the burnt cheese and and whatever spillovers that you have, and then you apply a, a paste wax uh, to the top. Um, I actually made a video about it. I actually cleaned my range. Um, if you go to YouTube and type in Galaxy Property Inspection, it's been on every slide that you've seen. Um, I have, I show you, I'm cleaning my, my, I did a video about cleaning my washing machine with Pang. I did a video about how to clean your, your glass top range, okay? I even did a video of how to, how to uh, find, you know, um, studs in your wall without using a stud finder. It's pretty simple. You need a magnet, um, but I digress. Self-clean temperatures. Okay, um, I want you to take a guess. How hot does your range get when you use self-clean? Self-clean is the, is the one feature I wish they would disinvent. It's horrible. He's saying, Virginia says 500. Do I hear six? 
Anybody six? Anybody want to go seven? 565. Is that what you just said? Virginia, did you say 565? 800. 800. Oh, I've got an 800. Do you want like to It's really nine? hot. I like it. Why don't you like it? One dollar. Have you ever left this out in the sun? Yeah. And it, turns it quits red. working. It quits working. It turns red and says, hello, too hot. Yeah. You know what electronics don't like? Every range that's that's out there that's been made within the last, I would say, 15 years. They self-clean between 900 and 1100 degrees. Now, just to put this into perspective for you, crematories start at 1400, right? We have to get the oven hot enough to basically burn any food and stuff that's that's left in there, right? Because, but at 900, 1100 degrees, you know what it'll do to the uh, electronics of the oven? It'll ruin them. It will ruin them. One of the biggest problems that technicians see out in the field is that everybody wants to self-clean their oven the week before Thanksgiving. It's like mom's coming. I, she can't see me with a dirty oven. So they put it in the self-clean. You know what they do? They blow the board because the board doesn't want to be 900 degrees. Not to mention, it's unsafe to touch the glass. If you touch the glass, you're probably on your way to the hospital, you know, it could be, which could be harmful for children that want to walk around. They don't think about these things. You know, kill the electronics. Um, you know, I mean, self-clean can do a lot of damage to a range. Okay, it is so much easier, and I I do this with um, on when people attend home inspections with me. If it's got like a Frigidaire or a GE or a Whirlpool um, range where the the door comes off, because most of them now they have flip they have hidden flip latches that if you know how to do it, it, takes 30 seconds to take the door off. Then you can get in there with some easy off and clean the oven and it takes 30 seconds to put the door back on. It is so incredibly simple and I love to teach people how to do it. Um, but that using easy off is so much better than doing self-clean because self-clean literally can fry the electronics in your range. Okay, Convection and true convection. I don't know if you've ever heard those terms before. Uh, a lot of people have a convection oven, but some people have a true convection oven. What's the difference? Convection is basically a fan in the back that circulates the air that makes your, you know, to help disperse the heat evenly in the oven. True convection, they take that fan and they put a heating element around it. Okay, so GE Profile, Electrolux, um, you know, obviously Viking Wolf, um, your higher end um, KitchenAids. Right. Um, so, um, if they've got convection, they're probably true convection, meaning they've got an element, a, a third heating element. Here's the thing with convection: you got to reduce your cooking time by one third. You know, if you're like again, if you're somebody after my own heart, and you're making chocolate chip cookies, they make what 13 minutes, right, in a regular oven. But if you put it on convection, you better take those cookies out, or out around eight minutes. Because if you leave them in there for 30 minutes, you're going to clinker those cookies. <laughs> That's a shame. Nobody wants clinker cookies. Okay, so convection, fan only, true convection, fan plus an additional heating element. Okay, so again, people set it at 350 and they put it on convection, but it's a true convection range. It's going to preheat faster. But it's also going to burn all your food if you don't reduce your cooking times. Okay, because of that extra element. Okay. Sometimes people will have glass ranges or, excuse me, um, gas ranges. And here's this burner head, okay? And you can actually take this off and you can actually wash it in the dishwasher. You can wash it in the sink. Now the burner head itself is bolted on. It's screwed on. And then you got your little igniter assembly. Here's the thing though. Sometimes when you take this and you just stick it back on any old way, now the range is difficult to light. So if people ask you if you've got any tips about this, they need to kind of pay attention to the way that they take this off and make sure that they put it on the right way. And if they're not sure, if it's having difficulty lighting, if you take this and just kind of rotate it a little bit left or right, it will usually solve the problem because, um, I don't know if you can see this, see all the little holes around there? 
That's where the gas comes out. If the gas is not lined up with the spark igniter, it's never going to light. So if we put this on here in such a way where the little flow of gas that's going to the spark igniter, if we put this on so that it's, you know, we're blocking it or we're shooting the gas a little bit this way or a little bit that way and not right at the spark igniter, it can be very difficult to light. But we can fix it just by rotating this, you know, you know, an eighth of an inch left or an eighth of an inch right is usually enough to put that gas right back in line with the spark igniter. So the range is much easier to light. Okay, a couple more slides and we're done. Um, so there we are. Okay, let me talk about tin foil. Okay, there's great uses for tin foil. The one you never ever want to do is line the bottom of an oven with tin foil. For me, it is the cardinal sin of, of ovens. You never ever line the bottom of an oven with tin foil. Does anybody want to admit that they do it? Yeah, David, I'm telling you. Um, two reasons. Number one, heating elements, they need to be able to breathe. They need air. You know, they turn on and heat up, and then they turn off and they cool back down. So they need air to breathe. If you put tin foil on the bottom of an oven, you'll choke the, you'll choke the element and reduce its life by up to half. The other thing is people put tin foil on the bottom of the oven and then they put it into self-clean, right? Because Virginia, she likes that self-clean, right? So we turn on self-clean and we're going to turn that oven on to 900 to 1100 degrees. You know what happens to tin foil at 900 to 1100 degrees? It fuses to the oven liner and then it's there permanently. And if you get in there with, you know, and try to scrub it off, it's not going anywhere because it will actually fuse right through the oven liner at those temperatures. Now, if you're looking at my slide, you may notice this little bottle of ketchup I've got over here. That's because I've got a little trick. People that fuse their uh, tin foil um, because they forgot to take it out, they put their oven through self-clean because mom's coming, coming up on a holiday, right? We're coming up on Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, Hanukkah, etc. Um, they're like, what do I do? Well, you got two options. You can either pay to have a whole oven liner put in your oven, which is basically a technician coming out and building your oven from scratch in your home. Good luck. Uh, it's going to be about a $1,500 service call. Or you buy a $4 bottle of ketchup. I prefer Heinz. I've just never been a Hunt's guy. I, pre I really prefer Heinz. Squirt the ketchup all over the bottom of the range. Let it sit there for about, I don't know, six days. And then take a hard bristle scrub brush and most of the tin foil will actually, uh, yeah, it'll actually scrub off. You know, uh, if you know any Italians, anybody here Italian? There you go, Lucy, you probably, you, your mom probably taught you a long time ago. If you make a lasagna, you never store a lasagna in a metal pan. You always store a lasagna in glass or plastic, right? Why? Because, because the lasagna, if you store it in the metal pan, the pizza sauce will eventually start eating through the metal. That's where this comes from. I learned this from Italians. Believe it or not, I've tested it. It works. Okay, we're almost done. Never, never line the bottom of an oven with tin foil. Okay, questions about um, clients from ranges. What is convection? We now know that's adding a fan. Okay, just remember when we have a convection oven, when we use convection, we need to reduce our cooking time by one third. You know, um, can I line my range with foil? Never. If I run self-clean, when's the best time to do it? After the holiday, <laughs> because you run a good chance of blowing the board. And if you do that like the week before Thanksgiving or something, chances are you will not have your range because service technicians, just so you know, in the service world, the week before Christmas and the week before Thanksgiving and the week before Easter, service technicians will prioritize range calls and no cools on refrigerators. Meaning if you call the week before uh, Thanksgiving and your washing machine broke, they're not getting to you. They might tell you two days or three days there, and then they'll then that day will come and they're gonna they're gonna call you up and say, yes, we need to extend you out because it's not a priority call. Same with dishwashers. Here are your dishwashers. Ranges and no cool refrigeration take precedence that week. Um, and the number one reason why they run, why technicians run calls that so many calls that week is because people put their oven into self-clean the week before a major holiday. 
Well, out my glass uh, light because the you know, burner cap is not quite on. Just move it an eighth of an inch. That's it. Just an eighth of an inch, one way or another. That's it. You know what rapid preheat is? Can I use Windex? No, use Windex to clean windows. That's it. Okay. Any questions about ranges? A couple questions. Uh, what makes Wolf Thermidor, uh, et cetera, better higher end brands? Uh, just, I mean, it's just the quality of the way the appliances are built. They don't cook food any better. They don't cook food any faster. They're just generally, it's like a heavier metal, a more robust cooking element, you know, more robust um, dials, knobs, those, those things like that. It's basically the fit, feel, and finish. It's not the inner workings. Yep. Uh, also, uh, if you're, when you're looking at a house, I've got a listing going live here today, but one of the questions I ask when you see a higher end range, always ask the seller, is it dual fuel? Which means yes. it's got a gas cooktop with an electric oven. And that is ideally what a chef or kit, a good cook would want. A gas oven can be very inconsistent um, in heating. And so, uh, just, just as a realtor tip, ask if it's a dual fuel if you see a gas cooktop or a higher end range, because most likely it is and you pay a premium for that. And a good chef or cook will appreciate that. The other thing, while he's on that subject, which is fantastic information, the other thing that don't, don't necessarily think that that drawer that's underneath is just a drawer. Most higher end ranges, that drawer is an oven. It looks like the drawer that you've all been storing your pots and pans in for a long time, okay? But it may have a, it may be, it's, and there's probably a 90% chance it's either a warming drawer or a mini oven, all right? If it's a warming drawer, it will go up to 170 degrees and then it's literally, it's the drawer that you, the, underneath, that you think, well, we store pots and pans in there. If it's a, if it's a warming drawer, it'll go up to 170 degrees to keep things warm. If it's a mini oven, it will actually go up to 400 degrees. So you can actually cook a turkey in the oven and in the drawer where you would think pots and pans go, it might be a mini oven. You can actually cook baked potatoes, you can cook a pie in there. So if it's an Electrolux, Wolf, Viking, if it's got a drawer underneath, chances are it's not a drawer. It is a mini oven or a warming drawer. Excellent. Um, okay. A couple other questions. I'm gonna let everybody turn loose though here uh, for CE. You're going to take page one of your study guide, fill in the information that Jim has uh, made blanks there for with your information as it is on the Trek database, and you're going to email or text that to him uh, today at the tomorrow, the latest. And I Just do have a list of me. who was on camera. Um, yeah, text. He prefers text. Yeah, so the easy way to do it is take a picture of it and just text it to me. And one other thing, I am a home inspector and I'm always looking for, for new realtors. Um, if you'd like my contact information, that I can, I'll send back to you. Just put a star next to your name. So, and I, otherwise, I won't send it because I don't want to bombard you all with my contact information if you don't want it. So, if you want my contact information for your cell phone, just put a star next to your name, and I will send that to you uh, when I get your text. Okay, just text me the first page. You don't have to text me all three pages. Yep. Take a picture. Text my phone. Instructions are going off. For those that, uh, for those you've completed the course, I've got a couple of, uh, so you can log off if you want, but for those who want to stick around for another couple questions, um, question on my gas cooktop, my husband has burned something into the drip area. How can I get that clean? Gas oven, burn something into the drip area. Gas yeah. cooktop, gas cooktop. Uh, yeah, that's Good difficult. Again. So yeah. it's, uh, you know, you've got the, the burner assembly. Yes. And then you've got the little grate that thing sits on. And then that little burner assembly is in kind of a depression, a pan. Yes. But it's not a removable something. It's part of the whole top. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a service call. And the, you're going to have to pay for it because it's not covered. So I mean, you could try your best to get down in there with some easy off and clean it as best as you can reach it. But I, we, I mean, Oh, I, I've got pictures that I could show you that will just, you know, you take off the top and there's so much, there's soup and chili and all kinds of stuff that's down in there. Yeah, that's, that's a service call because um, the, believe it or not, the manufacturer, the expectation and in the, in the um, owner's manual, anything that you cook on the cooktop when you're using glass top, when you use a, a gas range, 
should have a lid on it so that it doesn't spoil, doesn't spill over and get down into that area because it is an exposed area. And once it's down in there, there's really no way to get there without taking the whole thing apart. Uh, question about what can you share about the range that uses magnet for heating? Okay, that is called induction. And an induction range, um, it basically uses um, a magnetic force um, to, um, Here's what it here. Um, here oh, okay. Um, so it basically heats dipole molecules and makes them spin. And when the dipole molecules spin, they create heat. Now, in a ceramic glass top range, if you think about it, you've got a heating element that's under the glass. Okay. It then has to heat the glass. Okay. The glass then has to heat the pan. And then the pan has to heat the food. So by the time you, the energy that you've lost, from the burning element, heat the glass, heat the pan, heat the food, you've lost about 60% of the energy by the time it gets to the food, okay? Now, using induction, the reason why induction is so fast is because induction you, turns the pan into the heating element, okay? So it would be like cooking your food right on the heating element itself, okay? So 90 to 95% of the energy is transferred to the food when you use an induction range. That's why an induction range, if you put it on the power boost, um, you can heat a quart of water, you can boil a quart of water in 90 seconds. Why? Because the pan is the heating element. Now the reason, the, now the interesting thing is um, the pan is the heating element. So where the pan is not, the range will not heat. Now, through induction, it will actually, the, the pan itself will actually heat the glass. It's not the magnetic energy coming from underneath. It's actually the pan itself that will make the glass hot. So the induction range still has like a hot surface um, light that will come on, but it's actually caused by the pan and what the energy from the pan that's actually been put back into the glass, not from what's come up underneath. So you'll notice when people turn on an induction range, even on high, before they put a pan or surface on it, they can touch it and it yes. will not be hot. No, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. And you sometimes need to be mindful to a, a buyer that's buying a home with an induction cooktop in that they may need special pans. So Yes, they do. A magnet has them. to stick to the pan because induction completely works with ferrous metal, meaning a magnet has to... Um, a magnet has to stick to it because if it's not ferrous metal, it will never create the eddy currents that go through the metal that spin the dipole mag um, molecules in order to make that pan hot. Okay, if it's not ferrous metal, it will not work. If you use like cephalon, that's aluminum. If a magnet doesn't stick to it, it flat out will not work on induction. So you just need to know as a buyer's agent or a seller like about what is induction and what are those advantages? Um, it's speed. It's Yes, typically it's speed, speed to heat and efficiency. Very fast. And so it's it very efficient, but you have to have the right pans. There you go. Um, let's see here. My my won't my why won't my gas oven light? Um, that could be uh, you have a bad spark. Usually it's a bad spark igniter. Every technician carries every kind of spark igniter on their truck as they go out. Um, chances are that's what it is. In order for a glass, remember for anything a gas thing to light. The little, the gas has to be right in line with the spark igniter. If the gas is not in line with the spark igniter or if the spark igniter is not sparking, you will not light the gas. Well, it's a bad spark igniter. It's, it's pretty common and it's, it's pretty cheap service, Paul. Corinne, did you mean the gas oven or did you mean the gas cooktop? And that's real important as realtors to make that distinction when you're talking about ovens, right? Typically people call it the oven but you, the cooktop versus the oven is the obviously the, the body. Is it your oven or your cooktop, Corinne? Oven. Wow. 28 text messages. Thank you. Excuse me, Jim. Yes, sir. Um, do I just, did you say I just need to uh, take a picture of the 